Okay, so this was more of a generic way of describing it. Discussing gun rights as addressed through digital means, wading through bias, using connections for good, and future anti-gunners and their strategies and methods based on observed behaviors. I'm married a good to a entry tech point. writer. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we can certainly expand from there. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, if you've, if you've watched these mindless discussions in the past, we can go on complete tangents and completely, we can go down those rabbit holes. I see. Um, yeah. And I've said it before. I don't know if you've watched any of them that have been eight hours, but we can easily go that. Yeah. I'm going to call you at uh, some yeah. point, but uh, <laughs> Cause I got a case I'm, I'm of these free. just, just on, uh, just on tap going. right next to me. All right. I'm going to have to go with the, the, the water lose, but that and uh Sudafed, not Sudafed, uh, whatever that Musinex. Oh, good. Hooray. And again, I have my inhaler. Yeah, we'll be careful with that, huh? <laughs> Sarah, are you actually here? And if she's not, she can jump in. Yeah, so RSV was a lots of fun. And with my job, I do a lot of speaking with the public, pulling them over or responding to their domestics or whatever. Mm. It's not that fun. If I just to catch up uh, for some of the OSD people who may join or see this later, um, yeah. just quick on, on your background, you still yeah. an active police officer? Yep, yep. I've uh, been doing the cop thing since last century. Um took off about six years to go back to school S still did cop stuff in the background part-time and i have to say this quietly and i know my wife doesn't watch or listen so that's okay i just can't say it too loud what a big waste of time and money for me <laughs> if, if i hear that <laughs> yeah if i wouldn't have done that i would have already been retired interesting yeah because i have three years and change to, uh, before i have my full 20 okay so kind of reset things for you a little too much uh, kind of, kind of, but yeah, I, I would have retired three years ago Okay, had I not gone to school, well, but I'm a semester. It's been a couple of years since I, I went back to full-time law enforcement. I think I'm, a, I just have to do a semester and I got my, I, I got uh, good. a Put bachelor's and yeah, it's, but it's in geography. It's the only thing that was, that seemed remotely interesting at universe at the university uh, Utah works. state. Yeah. I hear Sarah's ready for retirement as well. No, I don't think she's old enough. <laughs> she can't hear me. No. Oh, I, I, I bet she can. She, yeah. She can. Okay. I'm muted so you don't hear the sounds of chewing. Oh, <laughs> some people like that. <laughs> yeah. It's an ASMR channel now. That's right. Yeah, let's not do that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, it's just a busy day. So we're, we're eating dinner. John's here too, but I don't think he's. Hi, John. Hey, John. Long time no see. Hey, hey, Chuck. How are you? Pretty good. Good. Excellent. So my daughter had uh, friends over for a sleepover and they were watching those videos and it made no sense. Honey, why are you watching this? This person's just eating because it's, you know, okay, whatever. Bizarre. And uh, John, again, for the, uh, for the new viewers, uh, that little, that little uh, display on your back wall there, this, this, this is uh, like a little, view into your personal life there so no this is actually a, a green screen okay no <laughs> it's not it's really not. there <laughs> as a matter of fact you can tell i have several loaned out right now so uh my buddy john the fish cop uh has a co-worker that was looking for uh new options for off duty and so i just grabbed off grabbed a couple off the wall and said take these let me know what you think and i'll probably get them back on the wall as a matter of fact i had so many holes i had to plug them up with other things that normally aren't on the wall so yeah <laughs> so you have to go out and buy something to replace Ew. you uh, the hole <laughs> there's this opening right here i need to put something there exactly well, that's, well, the, collection. that's pretty awesome it's 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 people don't quite understand the value of having first hand experience with things and so when they say they've been they've been carrying uh some form of a beretta 92 Okay, let's talk about the problem. Okay, I have one in hand. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not having that problem. You're yeah. dumb. Yeah. Or revolvers have actually, that side, revolvers have been a huge thing for the last couple of years. And it's been 
awesome. I've been absolutely loving them. Um, speaking of revolvers also, there's been so, and I have to bring this up every podcast. There's been a, a cool uptick in yes, revolver stuff, but brands that have redeemed themselves has been so exciting. Taurus of all I things. It looks like a Taurus. Yep. I can't, I, I carry this. This is one of my off duty carries. Oh, I like oh, it so gotten, much. Right. It is. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Because a couple of years ago, I wouldn't be caught dead. Nah. But we well, can now, thank uh, Cali for uh, for a lot of that, I guess, right? What was that? You can thank Caleb a lot for that, oh, right? Oh, absolutely. But, but um, they were, uh, so the, my contact at Walther jumped over and turned in the CEO at Taurus. And then he took one of his buddies from Walther because I work very closely with, with them and they've been doing such good things. And then Caleb's jump jumped on and he's massaged it and made it that much better. It's just yeah. so cool. He seems to be putting effort in. Um, and it's nice to see gun companies kind of going to the more autistic side of the spectrum and like getting the real gun nuts who can <laughs> kind of yes. really like pick apart the minutia of yes. why this, why that, and just start from that point. I mean, you got like JJ going into Beretta. I never thought I'd see a Beretta on the competition line like ever yeah. again. Yeah. And now everyone's like rocking 92 variants. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's something to be said for that. And I'm glad companies are, are doing that and pays off. Absolutely. One of the funny things that I, I don't remember which episode, but recently someone was talking about, yeah, if we get guns designed by engineers, there's some cool concepts, but they suck. Yeah. We need shooters to be putting in the, their yeah. two cents. And this is, here we I are. They appreciate how much, you know, how much we shoot. I don't even, you know, I should be better than I am, but uh, I certainly have the mentality. Like they don't appreciate like, after shooting so many years, I've been doing it for 20 years, 25 years. Yes. You just notice so many little things that you just can't tell unless you've been with a gun for a long time. Yes. Yes. A long, long time. And yeah, you can, you can articulate those things. And these are simple mechanical devices. You can pretty much kind of pick apart what needs to change or what needs to happen to improve or change that particular thing. Um, so yeah, we're, we're useful for something. Yes, absolutely. Matter of fact, I just recently had a post about that the uh 327 that. yeah That's super snub <laughs> it is it, it truly is but it's it's chambered in 357 and it comes with a larger grip and i figured you know with it being so light such a short barrel i'm going to be better off just shooting 38 wad cutters and so that wad is a cutters. dedicated bold move oh absolutely <laughs> um you, but, you and my uh, smith and wesson model 52 will get along oh, heck great. yeah heck yeah <laughs> um comfortable to shoot yeah. Hardly any recoil, very accurate. Yeah. And Punches terminal ballistics. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So uh, that works. And it's That's a niche. Awesome. Some people yeah. might say, yeah, I want to I want to put 357. Go have at it. I'll put 357 in that guy, which is yeah. its its brother, slightly yeah. longer barrel, more weight. Yeah. Same capacity, but yeah. Yeah. RIP all the hair on your hands. Oh yeah. You know, it's uh, <laughs> it's all gone. So Sarah, are you at a point where you're done chewing? No, but I will unmute. <laughs> I was just like scribbling down some notes real quick because I have things. <laughs> I know this isn't the airing of grievances, but I have grievances. No, 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 no. That That's perfect. Uh, so let me read you what I had. I don't know if you read oh, it or if, if you're around. You. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So it's just a nice that's way good. of saying people are dumb. No. Um <laughs> So I think from here, if we get a couple of people that jump in, no problem. I can add them to the panel. Uh, right now we have seven people watching. We're good. Uh, uh, and typically the, uh, the recorded shows get more views than seven. So, sure. uh, and for everyone watching, I'm not worried about us being in conflict with the Super Bowl because pff, I don't care. Clearly. I don't even know who's playing. That's how much I don't care. <laughs> Who is playing? John, John says the Eagles. He's just the Eagles, just against themselves, the against Eagles. the Cubs. <laughs> There's going to be a riot whether they win or lose. <laughs> <laughs> it's Kansas City. And okay. <laughs> just oh, so you know. <laughs> wait a minute. Chuck Haggard should be here because he, because Chuck is a Kansas City guy, but he said he had no intention of watching. 
I'm going to send him a link just in case. Because uh, one of the things he pointed out, and he has pointed out in the past, especially as a longtime veteran cop, is uh, public perception through the media in some law enforcement things. And yeah, it's interesting how uh, we might even have three Chucks on. It's interesting how things are manipulated and all of a sudden everyone thinks, not everyone, but a lot of people think, yeah, cops are going to come and get all of our guns. Uh, no. Most cops I know don't want to have anything to do with that. Hmm. The timing of this conversation is painful because Minnesota is trying really hard to pass a red flag bill where cops will do exactly that. Yeah, I think that's a very regional comment. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. what, are, what are the sheriff's offices saying against that or about that? Um, the chiefs of police have testified in support of it. We've had a couple of sheriffs write letters against it. Good. But most of them are uh, just staying out of it. What does the public say about that? Anyone who doesn't study this issue closely thinks it's a good idea. Yeah. It's kind of the, that's the standard answer for pretty much all gun control gets proposed. It's just like, mm -hmm. I don't care about this stuff. I don't really pay attention to it. I've been fed, you know, yeah. a one-sided, very negative, scary point of view. Yeah. So of course I'm just going to go along. doesn't affect me. Could not give a crap. Yeah. Um, yeah seems like a good idea. Yeah. I mean, well, who wouldn't think that's a good idea? It's common sense. Come on. Common sense. <laughs> well, and it's really not until you get down into it. You know, like the, um, uh, even the name of the bill, which they keep changing to make it more and more uh, palatable to their focus groups. But stuff like, I believe the, the current name they're calling it is extreme risk protection orders, because they realize that red flag sends, sounds too much like gun confiscation and that scares people. Um, yeah. So they've renamed it. Just call it happy uh, meal. Know, like, in theory, if you could predict who was going to be violent, with a high degree of specificity and then intervene directly. That's a good theory. That's the also law, pre -crime. Yeah. The law, the practical application of it is an absolute disaster on every level. Oh. And it's really hard to explain that to people because they just are like, well, it's a good idea. It's a good idea. Like the, yeah, it's a great idea. It doesn't work because yeah. we live in a country full of humans who need to be constrained or they will completely mess everything up. So it's like, it, it's just, it's not a real world thing. Yeah. Well, I recently posted something along the lines of talking about restoring rights or sh people getting restored and just tried to plant some seeds. So if there's a violent criminal and they serve their time, why shouldn't they be getting some rights back? Maybe even gun rights. Amazing. Because right. if they're still a danger to the society, why are they among us then? Shouldn't they be somewhere in New York? We're going to change New York. We're going to put up these walls. There's a movie about like this, right? Escape for New York. New York. Um, what's, what's the use of rehab? What's the, re, what's the use of these sentences? If they're number one, they're not being, they don't follow through. They're slaps on the wrists. There's no penalty. There's no penalties for reoffending. Hardly, prosecution doesn't care. So then there's the, someone like me. Okay, I'm just going to arrest this guy seven times for the same thing. Obviously, he's not getting it. Maybe he needs to stay away longer. Yeah. No, it's, it's a good question on both ends, right? The uh, you kind of hit on kind of the over incarceration, incarceration, and the fact that okay, you you paid a heavy price, but you you there's no change once you get back in society that mark stays as, as, as dark as it was when you went in. Um, so depending on the offense, obviously there's gotta be some level of like subtlety of like, okay, you, it wasn't violent. It wasn't against children or Definitely. domestic or things like that. It's like, okay, you are adjusted uh, accordingly. You are made whole in some way for, for doing your thing. Um, and uh, yeah, on the other side, it's you, you, in the California, it's like, well, we're not going to prosecute anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so you're uh, all on your own. <laughs> your, your your crimes increasing and laws are working. Wait, what? Yeah. Why so, is that? It's funny. 
Uh, just one other thing, Matt, uh, again, for, for OSD listeners, uh, yeah. who might not be familiar, uh, where are you from? If you don't want to get specific, but Utah. which state? Well, Utah. California, then suburb of Chicago, and then Utah since 97. Okay. So you're, you're, uh, you're a, I'm a Utard. <laughs> I hope to check out Utah soon, and uh, I'm going to visit St. George, probably get up to Salt Lake, obviously, Um, looking to re-domicile somewhere. Really? Um, So either Texas, Florida, looking at those places. Yeah. Um, Because I'm in Southern California, um, and I know, obviously, Sarah's in the Minneapolis Minneapolis, uh, area in Minnesota, um, just so people have a lay of the land here. Because when we all talk about our experiences, uh, it's funny because gun, um, the gun situation is like talking about different countries. Um, yes. Radically different. You talking about Utah, Sarah's talking about Minnesota. I'm talking about California. Someone could be from talking from Texas. And it's like, you're on different planets. It always blows my mind. Like your set of rights in this space are radically different to the point of like, should you be. execute that same right in New York versus, versus yeah. Utah? You're going away for a long time. Yeah. You're like no joke. Right. And how can that right. be? Like, how can they yeah. be this? I mean- what other place whatever what other right or what other anything in life has that 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 delta between that well driving is a privilege not a right correct and my license works in all 50 states i think everything else in life there's no disparity there's the the the, uh, the difference between states i don't think anything approaches what it is for guns no yeah it's really hard to imagine another scenario where what happened to Shanine Allen could happen to you. You know, she drove across the border into New Jersey, Oof. got pulled over with her perfectly legal uh, uh, revolver. I think she had her, I don't remember exactly what she had, but ended up in prison. And it's really hard to imagine other harmless behaviors that are criminal criminalized to that extent. Exactly. A victimless crime that is effectively a paperwork arbitrary decision by some completely out of touch legislative body that has such huge real world implications for normal citizens that are hundred percent legit people. And the good news is on this is that there are way more gun owners now who, and every time we, we hatch another million, two million, three million, seven million new gun owners, that's 7 million new people that we need to tell like, Hey, by the way, the mm-hmm. system you didn't look at for the past 20 years yeah. is in this state because <laughs> you wouldn't pay attention. Do you want to help maybe join yeah. OSD and help start changing some of these things? Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So I'm, I'm you know, uh, just for open source defense, which I'm a co-founder of the, the model in our heads is like, we have a lot to be positive on uh, for things like this. Right. Um, we have this ability to educate, to bring in people in the middle of the bell curve. Yes. <laughs> right? That's those uh, people. Need it. Right? It's these, yeah. are those. um, and get them, you know, just the beauty of what we need to do. It's, it's easy. It's, it's low hanging fruit. You just tell them what the reality is in California with where you can put your thumb on your rifle or which way you can hold your rifle. Right. And like, well, you, now you're going to jail for 10 years. Yeah. Now you're fine. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and things like that. And like that should get some momentum saying like, okay, let's, you know, we don't want to, that's, that's silly. Why are we doing that? So is open source defense primarily centered in California? Open source defense is incorporated as a Delaware corporation and is uh, based in Austin, Texas. Okay. Uh, we are kind of more of a virtual corporation. Like many are, we're distributed um, our founding members. We have seven founders, co-founders of OSD go from, uh, just to cut the basis here, we have California, uh, Montana, Georgia, New Jersey, Texas, and New Mexico. Cool. So those are our founders are from those um, various places. And if Utah was on your your list, basically Utah has three different areas. Southern is red, middle is brown, Northern is green. I live in green. That's like- Green is in like the environment? It's uh, mountainy, alpine, beautiful trees, and oh, as opposed yeah. to dead and flat. Exactly. Okay. Interesting. And Caleb just woke up. All right. Well, the hair's okay. I think he's been awake for at least half an hour. <laughs> and he's not drinking bourbon, so it's you know, it's a good so, sign. So we're gonna have a good discussion, right, Caleb? 
Yeah, absolutely. If you had told me that Sarah was going to be here, there never would have been any question about me coming on. So oh. you were, I was the question. <laughs> no, he, he hooked me with Chuck. He's like, do you want to do a, a podcast about gun rights? I'm like, eh, I don't know. He's like, well, he's going to be there. there. Okay. So no. <laughs> and so we may have uh, uh, two other Chucks. We'll see. And Rob, but if they can't make it, they can't make it. Life happens. It's okay. Um, <laughs> So I'll start our official opening. Uh, this episode is not brought to you by Taurus, but I will carry one. Just had to say that for Caleb. And I mean that truly. Would and, would you like this episode to be brought to you by Taurus? Because I feel like I know a guy that could arrange. No, that. no, no. I know. They've, they've offered. They have absolutely. <laughs> it's been brought up and I said, I'm not there yet. The guns are, have been wonderful. I'm not at that point where I'm it's not quite there yet. Walther, absolutely. I have a wall full of Walther behind me. I have several Taurus be- Tori behind me too, but yeah. I even well, have a Walther. They're so good that I managed to get one in California. <laughs> oh, Walther, let me get the full name. Walther PPQQ5SF, I believe is the full vernacular. So this one right here then has several get knocked over. Yep. That's yeah. Yeah. SF stands that's for cool. super freaking heavy. Yeah, and steel frame. I love, I love I love heavy guns. I'm a big advocate for uh for even for beginners. Actually, I start all my beginners on full framed uh guns to give them that kind of deadness in the hand. Um, instead of like, oh, here's a cute little, you know, Glock 34, 43, or whatever the tiny one is, um, or even a 19. Um, but yeah, that that Walter's great. I had to uh it was a gift for my father, um, which is the only way to get not is one of the ways to mm. get off roster. We have a handgun roster, which is effectively a handgun ban in California. Um, so only guns on this particular roster are, are allowed in. Um, and that roster hasn't improved in many, many years or been added to and is, in fact, decreasing quite uh, significantly. So, it's a- Well, one of the problems with the roster that people don't realize is it's quite expensive to get your gun on the roster to put it through the amount of testing and that sort of stuff that it requires. And any handgun that's approved for the roster needs to be reapproved every two years. So, you know, with Taurus, for example, we have a bunch of our small frame revolvers on the roster. And when those approvals expire, we have to take a really long, hard look at whether or not it's worth actually investing the money. Cause you have to, you can't just take the original paperwork that you did when you first got them on the roster. You have to redo the entire testing and approval process and be like, is this worth the money? And the roster is, as a fun side note, also the only reason why the Glock Gen 3 is still in production exactly. because it's the only Glock that's on <laughs> the roster. Huge factories producing Glock Gen 3s yeah. in, in Smyrna, Cal- uh, Georgia, just for California. Yep. Unreal. Yep. By the way, they're also $750 when they get here. <laughs> You're <laughs> shitting me. I mean, you can maybe on sale find a 550 or 650 but... You can get them cheaper in Indonesia. Yeah. Not, not really. Yeah. They're actually, I think they're still more. It's pretty, pretty bad. Well, I think I will officially start her up. Uh, I think a lot of the discussion we've had up until now, I'm going to keep and it will start, start it up. And then I'll do the little intro. This episode is brought to you by Kmart and Campbell Soup. And then do this intro. So now, I don't know how many you've actually seen or if you were just saying that to be nice, Chuck. But if you need to take off, let me know so we can make sure you can get... Uh, Uh, whatever plugs you need to get in. This goes for everyone. Plug whatever you want, whenever you want, especially when it's applicable. I'm a big fan of that. That's also how we can spread the word about good information and good people. Uh, During my intro, I'm also going to say something to the effect of pay pay attention where these guys are from, um, who they represent. And if you like what they say, follow them. So I think I'm going to lose my voice right now. I think I'm going to start the intro. Yeah, Caleb has the right idea. I'm going to mute for a second and cough. Might even break out the inhaler. And again, not this inhaler, but this inhaler. Caleb really wants me to see. see I feel like getting those two mixed up would be awesome. Terrible and also hilarious. It'd be awesome on camera. I guess so many clicks. Yes. 
All right. Well, I will start it up uh, with this episode 331, Navigating Insights on Rights is what I called it. Unless someone has a better better name, I can change it at the last minute. All right. Big Tech's ordinance has everything from complete firearms to OEM and aftermarket parts. If you're looking to put together your first AR-15, they have everything from those parts that you need to the tools that are going to be essential. If you're looking for suppressors, night vision, handheld lights, weapon lights, sights or optics, you name it, Big Tech's has it all. Not only that, they're offering all those brands that we like. Go visit them at BigTechsOrdinance.com. Overwatch Precision is a team of civilians and combat veterans based in Phoenix, Arizona, that employ industry-leading production methods, coatings, and materials in their striker-fired polymer-framed pistol trigger systems. With an internal engineering team focused on thoughtful design, Overwatch's flat-faced and curved triggers safely deliver a mechanical advantage to your carry or duty Glock, Walther, CZ, P10, and Smith & Wesson MMP 2.0 with improved function and increased accuracy. See more at overwatchprecision.com. Filster makes awesome holsters. But not only that, they also happen to be one of those companies that are trendsetters. A lot of their designs are emulated by other companies. Not only does Filstered make those holsters, but they also provide concealment systems like the Enigma, the Flex. They also have a lot of solutions when it comes to concealment solutions for medical. If you need to have a concealment first aid kit, they happen to sell them. Check them out at filsterholster.com. Primary Arms Government recently showed off a new giveaway, which features a new Daniel Defense M4 V7 rifle, complete with GLX 1 to 6 power first focal plane rifle scope, PLX mount, and more. These monthly giveaways are only open to first responders and members of the military, so there's way less competition for the big prize. Entry is also completely free with no purchase necessary ever. So if you want to have a chance to win, just visit primaryarms.com government and hit the giveaway button at the top. Walther is the performance leader in the firearms industry, renowned throughout the world for its innovation since Carl Walther and his son Fritz created the first blowback semi-automatic pistol in 1908. Today, the innovative spirit builds off the invention of the concealed carry gun with the PPK series by creating the PPQ, PPS, and the Q5 match steel frame series. Military, police, and other government security groups in every country of the world have relied on the high-quality craftsmanship and rugged durability of Walther products. Walther continues its long tradition of technical expertise and innovation in the design and production of firearms. For more information, visit WalterArms.com. Hey everyone, Matt Lanford here with Primary and Secondary. Welcome to Podcast. Today is, what is today? It's February 12th already. Unbelievable. Uh, the episode number is 331. We're going to be discussing navigating insights on rights. So what exactly does that mean? I don't know. Yeah, we're going to be talking about digital sources of information. We're going to be talking about how to navigate all of this stuff because there's so much conflicting information. We have politicians saying one thing. We have gun rights advocates saying others. Um, not all gun rights advocates are the same. They're not all equal. Um, also, it's, I think it's very important to discuss how to use our network basically for good. That's personally for me with primary and secondary. That has been a huge motivation to try to uh, promote the good information, promote the good people and um things that ultimately will help people because that's what all of this is about. And then it's free. Um, so let's see here. We're going to be discussing digital rights as addressed through digital means. Discuss gun rights as addressed through digital means. Wading through bias, using your connections for good. And also one thing I think Chuck brought this up. I really like this. We're going to discuss future anti-gunners and their strategies and methods based on observed behaviors. Now, if you haven't watched these, these discussions in the past, we can easily go down a rabbit hole and spend eight hours on one facet. The positive thing about that is we are going to cover everything possible, and you're never going to have another question about it. We're probably not going to do that, though, but we will definitely have different discussions that are going to sprung or they're going to spring from the primary uh, topics. It's going to be a good discussion. I'm looking forward to it. Anytime we can talk about this kind of stuff, I, I, I jump at the opportunity. Um, 
one thing I do say multiple times, at least I try to say it multiple times during these, make sure you're supporting those sources that you found to be beneficial. What that means, they're algorithms. They don't work in our favor. When I say our, I mean, anyone who is gun is pro gun. It's those algorithms aren't necessarily working in their favor. Whether you're producing entertainment with guns, educational stuff with guns, talk, educating people about gun rights, algorithms aren't really working for us. So listen to where all these panelists, all these people that jump in and share their insights, listen to where they're coming from. Find out who they represent. If you like what they have to say, follow them, subscribe. If they're saying something that's especially useful to you, if this has changed your insight or this has really helped explain something, make sure you're sharing their, their stuff because there's not enough of that. Not, there are not enough resources basically like pimping others. Everything, uh, so there's, it's so much dog, dog eat dog. And so many of these uh, content creators are in it completely for themselves. But if we kind of look out for each other and help each other out, we're going to be so much better because we are going to be our own algorithm and our own efforts are going to be more powerful than that algorithm. But that's, that requires some, some effort and that efforts on the listener. So with that in mind, you probably need to hit like right now. Now, if you're watching live that you don't have like, but you will, because this is going to be broadcast or this is going to be released on YouTube. So my background's in law enforcement, been doing the cop thing since last century. I'm a big, big fan of the idea of repealing the NFA, big fan of rights, big fan of the fact that part of my job is defending the rights of citizens that I serve. They're not there for me. I'm there for them. I, 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 I have a lot of friends that are cops that feel the same way. And unfortunately, that's also something that's greatly ignored. We were talking about some legislation that's occurring in Minnesota. We'll need to talk about it. Um, it's scary stuff. And it's stuff that I hate to see, especially when it comes from law enforcement. So let's continue with some backgrounds. I think I'm going to start with Sarah because, because. Hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, my name is Sarah Hauptman. Um, I will say right up front, I'm one of the owners of Filster Holsters, but my opinions on political issues are mine alone and do not represent the business in any way, shape or form. Um, that's something I feel like we need to just get out of the way. And the reason that is important to me, aside from just, it's just good business practice, but the reason that's important to me is because I try really hard not to base my, uh, not to base my life around my politics to the extent that I can. And the reason why is because if I decide that I only want to buy from the red team or I only want to buy from the blue team, then I'm basically cutting my experience of the world in half. And if we all do that, then we end up living in two little sub Americas and all of a sudden we're not in the same country anymore. And I feel like that's a problem. Um, so, if you want to get into all that philosophy, we can, but, uh, that's my, my personal opinion. And that's the reason I keep politics out of my business and business out of my politics to the extent that I can. And Sarah's also one of those people, when I get a, a topic that's just perfectly suited, I beg and beg and beg for her to join me and to talk <laughs> about this because she has such good insights on stuff. And sometimes if I get pissed off at people, I just message her and say, Hey, I, I need your, I need your help. I need to calm down. Anytime for real. I think you are doing really important work in the community and whatever I could do to support you. I'm all about it. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. And speaking of people that piss people off, Caleb. <laughs> I, of course, have no idea what you're talking about. No. I'm reformed, um, uh, just like the Protestant church. Um, uh, so if you don't know me, I'm Caleb Giddings. Um, and like Sarah, I have some important disclaimers to get out of the way. So my you know, firearms industry background, uh, I'm currently the brand marketing manager for Taurus USA. Uh, I've been in the gun industry as 
uh, mostly on the media side for the better part of almost 20 years now, um, primarily as a journalist, as a media guy, but with a few other roles mixed in there. And I need to caveat that on my politics don't represent my brand. And when I'm talking product and training and gear, like in that sort of stuff, I am usually speaking both in a brand voice and a personal voice, but politically it's important to keep that divide. You know, my personal politics and how I may feel about things may not represent the brands that I represent. And it's important to caveat that at the top of the show. Also, nothing I say in the show represents the, the opinion of the Department of Defense. So, cause I'm also in the Air Force and really, really nothing I say should be construed as an official statement or opinion by the Department of Defense. So well, with that caveated, I also, and something that a lot of people don't know about me is uh, I do actually have, uh, I used to be very deeply involved in the political side of this. I was a grassroots activist uh, in Indiana many years ago working to mobilize people on pro-gun legislation back then. I've also worked as an employee for the NRA in their uh, elections division, working to get pro-gun candidates elected in battleground states. Um, so I have seen a little bit of how the sausage is made on that side of things. Uh, and so I do have, uh, I also hold the, I don't know if it's a, I don't know if it's an honor, but I was one of the first voices who was very, very concerned about the use of ballot measures to drive anti-gun legislation because having seen campaigns like political campaigns in elect in battleground states, I was like, oh, these voters dumb as hell. All you got to do is write a ballot measure. And it turned out I was right. And you then saw ballot measures being weaponized against gun rights in many, many states just up until recently with Oregon uh, seeing that push through. So I, I was I was early on the train to say that was going to be a bad thing. And I had people say, no, that'll never happen. And I was like, yeah, OK, homie. Um, so that was uh Yay me. <laughs> um, and you are on TV. I was also on television. Yeah, I, I did a whole bunch of appearances for SHOT Show, for media promotion, for tourists. That's what I was on TV for. Not at all some reality show in 2010 no. that people still talk about. Well, I just know I was I was on the first season of Top Shot. We'll get that out of the way. There we go. We did the Top Shot. Uh, I've genuflected before the History Channel cross. I guess that means he's done talking. Okay. And now we have, at last, the savior of many, many, many Facebook groups. So I think it was 2016, one of our main groups on Facebook focused on firearms, guns, gear, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's now known as primary group at the time we called it novice group. Facebook found some reason to remove it. And so... I remember, I think I was working afternoons. I don't remember. But I do remember waking up and getting, having all these messages, people saying the group's gone. We've invested a lot of time and effort into this and Facebook decided to remove a group. So we were, we were rushing to try to find some way to appeal it. And I don't remember who it was, but someone got me in touch with this Chuck person. And this Chuck person said, Give me the info on it and I'm going to get, I'll get back to you right away. And then the group came back and this guy saved so much effort, so many hours of discussion and all, all this good information. And he did it for, I don't know how many other groups and to a point he's still doing that, but he's here now. So he, he, he he's taking a pause from saving all these Facebook groups to talk to us. Um, he also has a organization to discuss. We discussed it a little bit before we started. We can really get into the, into the, uh, weeds about it. And also this organization can help be kind of a filter when it comes to finding good sources of information. So Chuck have at it intro. Great. And thanks for, uh, that was very generous. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm Chuck Rossi. I have had a long career in, in tech uh, in Silicon Valley from probably the late 80s. Worked at a lot of very successful startups as an early employee, including places like VMware and Google and Facebook. Um, and I started in Facebook in probably 2007, 2008. Stayed there for 11 years. 
Um, in 2016, Facebook made a decision very ignorantly um, to basically, it's, you know, again, we want a little inside baseball here. Uh, the way it happened is some media group um, in those days, back in 2016, published like, oh my God, there's guns on Facebook, right? And actually in those days, there wasn't an explicit policy about buy, sell, trade um, from persons, you know, from people to do that. And of course, you know, uh, Facebook was always never realized it was the 500 pound gorilla and could do what it wants and was always reactive to what the press would say. And they reacted as, as kind of ignorantly or just uninformed. And they said, Oh, you know, heaven forfend, we do have guns on Facebook. Um, let's remove all gun content. So they removed about 6,000 groups, um, pages, business pages. Um, so they could report back and like, yes, we've taken action against this, you know, this, uh, travesty against humanity. Um, and obviously I saw that as the only probably resident gun guy and also the probably the most senior person who gave a shit about this space. Um, so I wrote a big company wide internal email that was right by may say very well coherent, not like from my cold dead hands, but like, Hey, I care about this company, Facebook. I think we're a force of good. This is 2016 before shit really got nuts. Um, and I said, like, we're a force of good. We're supposed to be connecting people to their interests. We just nuked literally millions of people and thousands of groups. This is unacceptable for these reasons. We are hurting our users. Okay. Um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg saw that and many other people saw it and, and agreed with it. Um, there was a little bit of an internal debate. There was actually a postmortem um, on how did this happen. Uh, there was like an all hands uh, that uh, I spoke at and Mark spoke at. And I got a bit of a blessing from Mark to say like, okay, go, you know, Chuck obviously has a reasonable approach to this. You know, I'm cutting you loose to go do what you want to do. I'm not, you know, I'm a, a, a tech guy. Do If anybody's in technology, I'm, I'm a, I had a pretty good name for myself in the DevOps space developer operations, release engineering, plumbing of software, basically, right? It's a it's an important space of every software endeavor. And I had a good name doing that. I built some incredible things at, at Google and Facebook um, that are still in use to this day. I stopped that or started ramping that down um, from 2016, 2018, till I retired in 20, uh, end of 2018 to work with the policy group, the community operations group, the non-technical side of the house at Facebook and Instagram to say like, hey, let's get a coherent policy here. Now, very clearly I was alone. <laughs> there were all sorts of employees who individually would back me, even some more senior ones, um, but the rank and file who were with me um, could do good things, but I was the one that had the most power because of my seniority and my, I was a director at that point. Um, so I could drive some of this stuff and I did as best I could. The policies we, at that time, from 2016 to probably 2020, for content and ads on Meta, um, Facebook and Instagram, were almost reasonable, all right? We made it so like, the big move was like, okay, as profiles, people cannot offer things for sale. We can't, there's no way we can manage that. We're at that point, like a billion and a half people all over the world. We can't figure out who's okay to sell a gun, which country, which state, local laws. It's a mess. It's also very niche, right? It's like we'd have to spend millions of dollars of engineering and oversight to figure this out. So nobody can, if you're a person, you can't buy, sell, trade a, a firearm or related kind of accoutrement, um, you know, sites, ammo, magazines, what have you, uh, for content. If you're a business, you're 100% can sell stuff on Facebook, not through marketplace or things, but you can have a business page. You can say like Taurus, you know, in my day, okay, PT99s are on sale and you can go get those, right? And if you're Taurus, if you're, you're Caleb's shop, if you're Sarah um, saying like we have re, uh, holsters and, and other uh, accessories for Taurus, you can post all that up. And that's still the case to this day, right? On the ad side, different set of rules. And again, this was much more conservative because what we did, you know, it's a complicated network on the ad side for Facebook and Meta. Those ads actually go through and are served on other, other places as well. So we were allowing like holsters and things to go through, but then like it would show up on a Buzzfeed, you know, the ad network would have, um, 
you know, so they're not the best holster companies maybe, but they would bleed through to Buzzfeed or some other, even Forbes. And then the, the, the guys at Forbes would lose their mind because, oh my God, you served a holster ad on our site, right? And again, it opened up a can of worms. So the ads policy, um, again, I made it as, I basically took the Safari Land catalog and said like, okay, all the stuff in here is good to go, <laughs> right? And it's been since, it held that way for a while. It was still a nightmare, but it has since changed that the new ads policy is effectively anything that attaches to the gun is not eligible for ads. You can't boost it. You can't, if your company does that, you can't boost it. You can't run ads. So there's still some leeway for holsters and, you know, Sarah and I can work someday if she, if they want to, they should be able to run ads on Instagram and Facebook. I don't know if you have Sarah, but um, it's, it's dual. Um, and I can fight that f battle for you or help you. Um, but the ultimate issue with all this, and, and I say this, and, and I think Caleb's shaking his head because it's all bullshit, um, is because they don't do it well, right? Even though we have rules in place, they completely suck at implementing that rule. So they are constantly taking down stuff, what we call a false positive, where it's like, we followed the rules, but we're just don't really care about this space. We're not putting a lot of effort into it. We're going to make mistakes. We don't really care because it's very small vertical. You could all disappear tomorrow really don't care. Um, so long story for that. I, that was my life for the last uh, bits of Facebook. And actually after I left, it's kind of still my life because I have done escalations. Um, I just gave a talk at the shot um, just this last January. I had a talk for NSSF, um, National Shooting Sports Foundation, giving a one hour in-depth analysis of here's how you can survive on the socials now as a shot show participant, right? In that industry space. The organization I founded, uh, co-founded leaving Facebook is called Open Source Defense. And OSD, uh, opensourcedefense.org, is 100% gun rights, 0% culture war. We only care about gun rights. We are not red or blue. All we want to do is increase the number of people owning guns, finding resources about guns, getting better education, uh, doing behind the scenes work with the industry and with the social industries as the, as the subject matter expert for these Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram that have zero people on staff who know, a, literally I was at Facebook, I did, uh, the person in charge of stuff didn't know the difference between a rifle and a shotgun, right? That's like the first question you can ask somebody if you, if in these places, they're like, so do you know what a rifle is or a shotgun is? Like, nah, not really. <laughs> um, so the OSD is how I can continue doing what I was doing, have an impact, get more people on board um, in a very culture-free way uh, and expand our, uh, our rights. So that was a little verbose, but that's a, that's a high-level overview. I just want to point out. Oh, oh I, I just want to point out something Chuck said, and I just want to bookmark it for later discussion. But you gave a really good example of false positives, and I, I want to come back to that later. Sure. One of the things Ash, ha Ash has said in a podcast with us a couple of years ago was talking about focusing on that demographic that's not right or left. They're just right in the middle, and they're not exactly sure where they lean and how important it is to be able to reach those people. And it's a wonderful opportunity for education. And it kind of, this kind of links into what we were talking about just prior to us starting as well. Um, and open source defense is primarily Twitter. Yeah, we have a newsletter. Um, so please subscribe. Uh, I'll get, do some plugs right here. Um, yeah. Please subscribe to our newsletter. It's a sub stack. It's free and it's very good. It'll give you perspectives that you absolutely are not seeing from any other gun control organization or gun rights organization, or for that oh. matter, gun control organizations. <laughs> Freudian um, slip. No, because we, I mean, we actually pick apart both yeah. ends of it. Yeah. Um, so for you won't uh, see the analysis that gun control orgs are doing and you won't, you know, necessarily see the viewpoint that other gun rights organizations are seeing. So that's the Substack. Yeah. Join that Twitter at open SRC defense. Um, is our main kind of more real-time discussion platform. Uh, those are our two big ones. Also, I just want to plug one more thing. We just started a Discord. Um, so if you go to Discord, search for open source defense, um, you can join that Discord. We uh, thought there'd maybe be a few. We just did this this week. Thought we'd get like 20 signups. We have over 600 so far. Um, we're very happy with that. That's how that's going. And I'm trying not to piss off too many people there. 
Um, but in, <laughs> in line kind of space, yeah, it is, it is, and it's very pleasant. Um, yeah. In line with the idea of reaching the people in the center who are kind of fence sitters, to be able to share a Twitter post or tweet is so easy. It takes zero effort. So if you see that Twitter feed and you know what, it explains something perfectly. Well, it's a great opportunity to share it. And yeah. it doesn't necessarily just need to be shared on Twitter. It can be shared to Facebook. It can be shared, you name it. Hell, text it to people. Because we all know people who are fence sitters in this. Yeah, let's talk about that. So fence sitters. The, if you think of like political activism as a bell curve, there's a lot of people in the middle who don't really act in either direction. And if you are part of an advocacy group, like, uh, for example, um, any of the state level groups, FPC, Second Amendment Foundation, all of those guys, you don't get anything from the middle. All of your support comes from the extreme end of the bell curve. So I'm talking donations, I'm talking volunteers, uh, the people who are doing the work in moving this cause forward, they're all on that extreme side. Yep. And it's very easy to fall into the trap of only speaking to them. Yeah. And, and that's fine. You know, like if you're, if it's not a mixed conversation, you can say whatever you want, right? But as soon as you're in mixed company, you have to start being a little more careful. And the problem that happens is that when those groups appeal only to that one extreme, uh, as soon as people in the middle start to get scared, that's when they start to act. And if there's nothing on your side that helps them to empathize with you, then they'll act against you without a second thought. So appealing to the middle is difficult because you have to appeal to the middle when times are good. And it costs you money, it costs you time, it costs you energy, and you get no return because those people aren't going to donate. But the time when that really pays off is when things are bad and they still see you as human, that's really important. Because without that, it's like, it's so easy to take away someone else's rights. Yeah, It's we really have a... hard to give away your own rights. Exactly. We talked about that when you and I talked uh, a couple of years ago, but... Um... History is not kind to unpopular minorities. There's two axes we need to worry about, you know, being, uh, you know, being popular, uh, being uh, a minority of number of people, you know, interested in something. Um, so if we find ourselves on the bottom end of that, of that line, uh, you get exponential loss, <laughs> right? Um, so normalizing gun ownership, you know, taking that that center part of the bell curve and giving them a home uh, is what OSD was was really focused on. And it's not easy because we're lucky we don't need, we're not a fundraising organization where we, you can donate if you like uh, through our Substack if you want to throw some money our way. But uh, as it stands now, we don't need to raise money. Um, and it's hard because everything that comes out of our mouths is weighed quite thoughtfully. Um, the the seven principles I will say are a unique set of of seven people who have our personal beliefs. Believe me, um, hard hard whatever direction on many topics. But when we put something forward on Twitter in a newsletter, even in the Discord, it's thoughtful. You we will not do a knee jerk reaction. We will not. You know, I, I love FPC, but you won't see fuck you no. Um, probably from us. <laughs> and, and we need people to say, fuck, you know, and I'm glad FPC does. Right. But we don't need another group doing it. Right. Um, so yeah, that's, that's our challenge. And it's not easy to do because it, we're a little maybe slower, more thoughtful, and we're not going to go for the main thing. We're going to like take another approach of like, Hey, normal person, this is why this new brace thing is kind of messed up. Right. And how it can affect you. Um, well, so it's hard. And the, the, the problem that you run into with the extremist voices is there was a time when those extremist voices were 
sort of siloed off. Um, and I'll use the election cycle as an example of this, but everyone looks at the presidential primaries now, right? And we watch the candidates in their own party primaries just say the most out of pocket shit you can imagine to appeal directly to their bases. Absolutely. And then once they get that nomination, they spend the first six months of the general campaign walking back that out of pocket shit because they need to get some corn farmer in Nebraska to vote for them. Um, and that's true regardless of party. And what used to happen before the current instant media area or era was the out-of-pocket stuff that they would say during those primaries would stay confined to those primaries. It would, by and large, stay siloed off in those avenues where it was never going to penetrate to where a corn farmer in Nebraska would hear about the wild thing that you know candidate so-and-so said in their primary debate because no one gave a shit about the primary debates. Really, um, the only people who cared about primary debates really before like 2012 ish were like hardcore policy wonks right and then you really started to see the rise of the instant media cycle around around that time and what has happened since then on the on the media side is that has accelerated exponentially it hasn't like accelerated at the previous rate the rate of acceleration has increased and increased and increased so that if governor desantis says that he thinks gay people smell bad you know to a dinner of 45 high level fundraisers it will be all over twitter within minutes you know not days or hours or not even or you wouldn't even hear about it and so what we've seen on the media side is accelerationism of the extremist messages, which then makes it feel like to people who are politically moderate or moderate on an issue that there's more people with these extreme opinions than there actually are, when really what you're seeing is an accelerationist effect where someone is getting paid money to pour gasoline on a fire, which is, a, in my opinion, one of the biggest problems that we have with modern journalism and this is true of firearms industry journalism as well and i'm extremely critical of a lot of people in my own space on this where the uh, the desire and the tendency to be chicken little and say that the sky is falling is so strong because that's what gets people to click and those clicks are dollars and those dollars are how people pay their fucking mortgages and when you incentivize uh, amplifying extremist rhetoric, you make the problem worse than it actually is. Yeah. They, they, you know, I just had a discussion with a, a shot with a, it was Pete from the TFB. Um, we did a little podcast of three, three OSD principles. And that was his first question was um, kind of directed to me because it's all my fault. Apparently it was like, how has social media like destroyed our ability to think <laughs> was effectively the question, you know? Yeah, um, I I always push back when people say that because people have been dumb as fuck since there have been people. Uh, we, yeah, it's a, social media has just allowed all of the dumb people to find each other easier. That's that's we're not any well, dumber than we used to be. We just now have like more dumb people finding each other and screaming about it. They're all tricky. in nation groups. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh God, it's I tricky. I mean, honestly, I I. It's easy to have that opinion, and I don't. I don't disagree necessarily, but um, we are as a species probably in our best state, <laughs> like it or not, not right. Um, as far as the ability to be educated, the ability to know things, um, and you know, we should be of all people. We should be careful. I mean, uh, uh, the common thing I see with with a very anti gun people is that they cannot conceive that normal human beings can own firearms because they're just too too dangerous, too complicated, too much to handle, right? And you just you know, think like, well, my neighbor's a moron. I don't trust him to back his car out. But somehow, I mean, you can look at the firearms, you know, uh, accident rates is in the, in the triple digits, which is too much, but it's like three, four, five, six, seven hundred 700 a year, which is insanely low for how many hundreds of millions of guns that are out there, right? So like, as dumb as we are, our self-preservation is pretty good, <laughs> right? We can handle these firearms. We can handle like operating in the modern world. Um, which is not an easy task. What we're just getting onto now is this new thing of, of for us, for social media. We're the first generation 
to go through this new paradigm of communication that we, you know, are clearly still figuring out. Right. Um, so I think that's going to improve. So I think uh, Caleb's analysis is certainly correct in that we were able to just friggin' fast lane stupidity in giving it a, a platform where it could go. But I think it will evolve to like, not quite the library of Alexandria, but, but something more useful and something more routine that can be used as a utility for, for good instead of just, you know, just shrilling the madness, um, in, in Twitter and, and, you know, the, just pumping up the extremes for clicks, like clicks will not be the currency forever. Right. No. And I, I agree with that. And I actually not think that activism either. Right. That's true. Yeah, that's a good point. Not to interrupt you, Caleb. I apologize. No, go ahead. That was You're one of my one grievances. Of the people that that I... interrupt me whenever you want. <laughs> I hate it when people interrupt me. So I really try not to interrupt anyone else, but it's with the lag. It's kind of difficult. Um, but yeah, that that's actually one of the grievances that I wrote down as we were starting this is that, Clicks are not on their own. They are not activism. And the problem that we run into in our community, especially it, it's everywhere, but you know, focused in on ourselves is that we spend so much time and energy focusing, focusing on the outrage porn of like, Oh my God, did you hear what the liberals said? They wanted blah, blah, blah. And we focus on that to the extent that it no longer motivates people. It paralyzes them. And I think that is one of the more serious problems that we need to figure out um, as a community if we want to move past this, because it's one thing to send out a, a fundraising email and uh, sorry, FPC, but throwing you under the bus here, send out a fundraising email about treason and tyrants and blah, 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 blah. And that stuff works. You know, it raises a lot of money from people who, you know, swallow that kind of stuff. But the, the thing that it does in the larger picture is it makes people feel like the enemy is huge and it's hopeless. And it actually, it demotivates a lot of people who are on the spectrum of being on our side um, to just do nothing. Like, oh, well, you know, they own the media and they own the government and they do like, you know, we're the victims here, so I'm just going to stay home. And uh, I think that was a big contributing factor in the low turnout um, on the Republican side of the last election. Um, and I think that's a big factor just in general on why it seems like gun rights are losing, even though we're gaining ground in, in almost every state. Along the same lines with that same company, I had to stop following them because of their rabid attacks against law enforcement. You know what? Yeah, cops aren't necessarily going to be our friend, but we don't need to make them our enemy. And I have a lot of cop buddies that are just like me, very pro-gun, very pro-rights. I don't agree with the message. I can't endorse that. I can't share it. Right. And it's tough because FPC does so much yep. incredibly good work. And like we still donate to them. Yeah. Um, but we make it a point to send in a note along with our donation. Like we're not donating because of whatever dumb crap you're sending out in your fundraiser emails. And in fact, we think that's terrible. Um, but you know, they, they are uniquely effective, I think. Um, and one of the few groups that I really think gives a good return on your donations. So mm -hmm. like if you, if you're going to, you know, decide a group's worth based on how much of every dollar do they spend actually helping. I think FPC is way, probably one of the best out there. Yeah. Agreed. I really wish they quit doing that crap, but, but they do so much good that it's, it well outweighs the bad they do. But some of that stuff, you just kind of look at it and you're like, oof, no wonder everybody stays home on election day. I wish they were better at picking sympathetic defendants too. Mm. But, yeah, <clears throat> but that's that's a well, actually, no, that's not that is actually an issue. Like, you know, one of the strategies for winning lawsuits is to pick defendants that people can relate to, which is why, um, you know, it's it's part of why Heller was successful. It's part of why McDonald was successful, because those were sympathetic defendants. And some of the defendants that have been put forward in uh, lawsuits that I've seen uh fpc back i'm like 
are you guys super sure that was the dude we want to throw this case behind? I don't know. Sometimes, I mean, I get that and I, I agree with it, but I also feel like Sometimes the timing is such that you like it's better to do it now than to wait for that perfect event and that may never show up. Yeah, absolutely. There, I, I agree that there is a strategy. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, I'm very, very clearly, I am not a lawyer. Um, rather, I'm the guy who writes checks and donates and does phone banks and things like that. And so, you know, I, I definitely agree that sometimes you do have a strike when the iron is hot. Um, I guess I sometimes question whether that's the right choice, you know, and I've had strategic and to be fair, this is just an FPC issue. I have questioned the strategic wisdom of a lot of pro-gun wins and pro-gun losses and, you know, that stuff going back pretty much for as long as I've been doing this. And it's, I think it's because I, uh, because my political background is directly involved in watching the sausage get made that I have so many questions about it, you know, where, cause I'm like, um, it's like people who have never experienced the DC microcosm have no idea how badly DC is divorced from the reality of people's day-to-day lives, especially at the professional. And I'm not talking about the, the elected representative level, but the political machinery that makes DC function is completely divorced from how you and I go through our lives. It's not staffed by, it's staffed by careerist, uh, it's staffed by people with jobs, right? And their only interest is not losing their job. So whatever thing pushes that, and I get, I don't know, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm kind of off on a tangent here, but I guess it's when I think about how do we best activate those levers? That's always my strategic question, right? Is this lawsuit the best way to activate those levers? Is this, you know, piece of legislation the best way to, you know, machine change in that era, because in that area? Because, you know, ultimately the people that end up enforcing these policies, the people your senator hasn't written a fucking piece of legislation in their entire career. That's written by their staffers, right? And their staffers are DC professionals. These are people who live in Washington, DC. Their jobs work around that. If that senator loses an election, they recommend to, you know, the person that takes over, they're like, oh, hey, well, so and so is really good at their job. So you should keep them on, even though they're from a different fucking party. All right. This is not it's it, anyway. I, I have strategic questions from time to time. That's all. That's, I guess that's where I was going with that. I felt like I had a point, but I didn't. <laughs> well, there, there's uh, something to be said for, uh, so just as full disclosure, I worked, um, this also gets the the hardcore gun nuts a little, little wary about me, but uh, in 2015, I actually volunteered. Uh, I took a short LOA uh, from Facebook and worked uh, as a consultant for uh, FBI Sieges Division, um, which is the one that handles NICS, uh, because the Obama administration at the time was doing NICS 2.0, and they wanted some nerds to come in and like, uh, how do we do this? Is this right? Um, are we using technology from this century? Uh, spoiler alert, they didn't. Um, so uh, I saw, like like Caleb says, I, I saw just like slap in the face of how things work. And it helped kind of one of the points that we make, uh, one of our principles at OSD is culture, not politics. We probably won't spend a lot of our time to direct lobbying. We want to be a resource for politicians as far as like, you need someone other than the NRA to have talking points instead of the ones I've heard. I've been in this fight since about 1988. Okay. Um, you don't need the points that we were making in 1988, which are the same points that are being made right now. If you go, you know, if you want to have some, something balanced, like, well, we got all the Brady, all the, um, Bloomberg groups giving us advice. We'll go ask the NRA what their thing is. And that's not, NRA is not a position or not in a healthy spot where they're going to be that forward thinking or, or re jiggered their whole approach. So we would certainly like to be that level of SME for as another uh, alternative to that. But ultimately, we want to change culture, not politics. 
because culture will drive politics, right? Eventually. Hard to see with kind of the way it is now, but if you know, you're old enough to remember, Matt, probably the blue dog Democrats and how off the table gun control was uh, during a certain during various points in history, because culturally no one's going to stand for that. Right. Uh, we didn't have like we didn't feel like we were, you know, the media wasn't giving us this epidemic of gun violence. Right. And these other scary words that have been invented and thrown in our face every day, like a like computer. Weapon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that. Um, so, yeah, those things. um you know, we didn't have those things. We could drive the politics by, by culture. Uh, and the, the objective we want is like, okay, well, if there's no constituency that wants this, it's going to die off. These people, and Caleb can attest to this, they are backbones of, of, of cooked lasagna, right? It's just like, they don't care. They're just going to go whatever direction. And if gun control is off the table, they are more than happy not to discuss it, bring it up and take that plank out, Right. I mean, there's sure there's some diehards who are who are total Bloomberg, you know, kind of uh, need that they need that money. Um, and if Bloomberg, you know, the only reason modern gun control exists is that Bloomberg Foundation. There would be no gun control zero if it wasn't for Bloomberg's organization dominating media. I sat in a room in 2015 at the FBI headquarters in West Virginia when we were talking about Nix 2.0, and as a kind of a outreach, they had some NRA reps come in and they had Bloomberg reps come in. And even in 2015, the Bloomberg reps were all young uh, lawyers, r- raring to go, right? They had like, they were looking at every angle of how could they pitch, how could they maneuver what they wanted to get out of, out of the Nix 2.0 and, and gun control and gun, gun laws in general, knowing full well they had Obama in the White House I will give some credit to to CJIS and to the FBI group there. Um, they very much try to stay independent and try to like they are they were mission focused from what I saw. They want Nix to be good. We can all debate if there even should be a background check system. Reality is there is. To make it better and actually fair and correct is probably a worthwhile endeavor while it exists. While it exists, does not preclude us from trying to kill it. But if it's going to be there, it should freaking work. And that was my objective in going there. And we achieved some degree of that. So, yeah, that Bloomberg group like woke me up and like said, we are outgunned here. And it's proven itself, at least on some fronts, that the Bloomberg groups have been able to kind of just dominate the narrative of SARS, the vocabulary that the media uses, what they report and how they report it. um, That's all from one source. It's very, uh, very interesting. You're you're a big old infringer, Chuck, for even suggesting that we should have something like background checks and not suggest uh, <laughs> and, and allowing that there's that that we have to deal with the reality of the world that we live in, which is actually one of my personal frustrations with um my side in this issue is yes, damn. Do I think that I should be able to buy a Thompson submachine gun from the Sears catalog and have it delivered to my front door? Yeah, that would be lit but that's not the world that I live in. And so you have, you know, advocacy groups and I actually see, I don't even see it as much with groups as I see it with, you know, individual influencers and stuff like that, where it's very easy to make a YouTube video that says all gun laws are an infringement, get people all fired up about abolish the ATF and da, 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 da. And I'm like, okay, cool. Abolish the ATF. Uh, What's next? Because those regulations, the, the Code of Federal Regulations isn't going away. Yeah, the it's GCA 68 is still there, right? Yeah, the laws that that the ATF is charged with enforcing don't disappear. So what? You've abolished the ATF. Great. Who takes over? The FBI? Is that what you want? Because the internet told me the FBI is entirely corrupt and can't be trusted as an org. So I, I, I like rhetorical fervor, right? Everybody loves a good Bible-thumping pastor screaming about damnation and hellfire because it's fun to watch. But where a lot of that breaks down for me and where my constant and eternal frustration has been and why I'm not, I I am extremely politically involved, but not publicly. Like you guys don't see, and I'm, I'm very intentional about not being publicly politically involved because I don't want to get involved. I don't want to have to have those conversations with the abolish the ATF people because 
it, that doesn't actually do anything, right? Like, yes, damn, we should be able to do all of these wonderfully cool things, but that doesn't change the reality on the ground that we live in right now. And if you, I want to talk to people and deal with people who are like, hey, what is an incremental change that we can make that helps us protect future gun owners, that helps us enshrine the shooting sports so that there's, you know, statewide funding for things like that? Like, that's what I'm interested in. And that's where I think we make many more cultural wins, right? Like in, you know, I forget where it is. There's a Western state, one of the Wyoming, Montana, you know, one of those interchangeable cold places that I don't want to live, um, where they've recently passed a bill that allows states to tap, that allows individual school districts to tap into state level funding for marksmanship programs. Hmm. That's great. That's fantastic, though, that no one at no one who, you know, is yelling abolish the ATF on their social media feed into the darkness even knew that happened. Right. But that does more to preserve gun rights than all of the Twitter, Instagram, Facebook outrage that you'll ever do, because what that means is some kid somewhere is going to go to school and it's going to be like, all right, I need to pick a freaking after school program. I don't want to play soccer. I don't want to play football. There's a shooting. My, my dad's got guns. I guess I'll go try shooting. And then they become an advocate for the shooting sports for the rest of their life because it was a funded program. And that's. Yeah, I, I have a 20 minute rant about how school funded shooting sports education could change the landscape of this of gun rights in this country within two generations. But that's that's a pipe dream. I'll never have that kind of money. So, Well, along similar lines, we were talking about somewhat grassroots. And using a resource like what Chuck has, everyday earth person can go and read through this read through the read through a post, read through these resources and bring up some of this at work, bring it up with a friend, take someone shooting. And just that, that effort alone can help get some, and I'm, I'm going back to the people that are sitting on the fence um, that can help those people that are sitting on the fence. So we don't necessarily just have to rely on these bigger organizations to do all the, the moving. And especially if, if we might be disappointed in some, or Sarah, are the archives of Guns Guide to Liberals still like available online? Can people like go download that? Yes. Can you plug that? That's because another, that's another great one. Fucking sure. Listen to that. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, there is a podcast that my husband John and I did. It's called Guns Guide to Liberals. It is not Liberals Guide to Guns because it because it is the uh, it, it's kind of a play on that, right? The whole podcast is about how to advance the second amendment cause by talking to people who don't agree with you. Um, and it's all about taking, you know, like Caleb was talking about passion and, and that like fervent belief. And that is your North star that guides you, right? You don't get there overnight. And what you can do in the meantime is take little incremental steps and little bites out of this problem and keep your North star in your vision, right? But but you can't skip right to it. It just doesn't work in reality. Um, so the podcast is about how to use your guiding passion to talk to people who may be um, very emotionally engaged in this topic and disagree with you, or they may have a lot of misconceptions um, about the facts of how things work. But you know, you've all tried to correct somebody on the facts and it never, ever works. Why is that? Well, you can find out, listen to the podcast. Um, not only can you find out why that is, you can find out how to get around that and how to convince somebody. Hey, I can't um, recommend that podcast enough. Uh, the amount you. of effort clearly to organize it and to it's, it's information dense and readily absorbable. There's not a wasted breath. Um, so it's worth every second there's no uh there's no fluff it's all just really good stuff i appreciate yeah, no that joke for for people listening i've gone back and listened through it multiple times um just because <clears throat> it is very information dense and stuff i didn't pick up through on the first listen through or the first run through an episode i was like oh yeah that's a really good point and you know in full disclosure john and sarah are two of my dearest friends in the world um i would tell you to and 
that was initially why I listened to it because they were like, Hey, check out our podcast. I'm like, of course I will. Homies support the homies. But if it sucked, I would have been like, Hey, this is okay, guys. I got, I got I'm just so busy. You know, I just, I got all this stuff to listen to. It did not suck. And I really do. Cause I think a lot of times people approach this conversation as trying to win. Right. And I know I've done that. I I have had conversations where I wasn't trying to have a conversation. I was trying to win an argument. And right. when you stop approaching conversations with people that disagree with you as something that you're trying to win and start approaching it as a conversation between two people who fundamentally want the same end state, right? Like, I don't know anybody who's pro gun who wants school shootings to happen. I don't know anybody who's anti-gun who wants school shootings to happen. So we actually both want the same end state. We want this terrible, rare occurrence to stop. But we don't approach the conversation as both of us saying, how can we make this terrible, rare occurrence stop? We approach it because they're saying we make it stop by taking guns away. And then we say, no, we make it stop by... I don't know, actually, whatever the solution to banning violent video games or whatever the solution du jour is. Yeah, I mean, the solution du jour is generally hand waving about mental health availability and, and things like it's that. It's the soup of the day. Yeah, actually, there's a OSD post, um, uh, one of our newsletters um, actually examines it another way, just to just to go off on a side here on the school shooting thing. Um one way to certain that's been proven to work is uh, media suppression. So uh, the example we give, there's two excellent examples of this. Um, one is the Vienna subway. Um, when it opened back many years ago, very crown jewel of the city, this subway they'd been working on forever, sleek, beautiful. Um, after it opened, people started committing suicide, jumping in front of the trains. Huge thing. We just have all this coverage of this thing. We now have this horrible thing the reporting on it goes exponential because it was already in the news. And now it's like really interesting because this horrible thing's happening. And so more suicides happened. Uh, they eventually just basically stopped covering it by, by edict. Right. Uh, and it dropped off the cliff. Um, the Palo Alto su suicides in Palo Alto, um, the students, uh, I don't want to talk, I won't get into the details of the crazy dynamics of shallow Alto, California and the craziness that goes on there in Silicon Valley. And the final example is uh, the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, there are multiple suicides off the Golden Gate Bridge uh, on a pretty constant basis. And when they report on them, it just does nothing but increase. There is an agreement among papers and news organizations that they will not report on Golden Gate suicides um, because 100% they know it'll make it worse. Um, but somehow this doesn't apply to these horrific events who are, the more they report, it's like a magnet to 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 drive this and i don't think i think that's quite obvious um well it's super obvious the last two of these assholes who did this we, during the post shooting investigations they discovered discovered research materials right. of previous mass shooting assholes it's like oh look what this loser dickhead did to get famous let me go ahead and copy from the loser dickhead playbook right and I think someone posted in the chat, but there's you can kind of go research on this phenomenon. It's well known. It's not we're not saying anything earth shake earth shattering here. But one of our another one of our OSD uh, publications, actually our, our sister org, um, had a post uh, HWFO. Um, he proved it. He's like I made. He's had a paid Substack on a, a different set of topics, but he basically covered you know. Uh, one of the shootings and effectively made money. It's like I can prove provably make more money when I when I cover these things if I talk about them, right? Hey, and I'm going to be critical of our own side here because um, we're just as bad about this. And what you terms? know when we when one of these events happens and we're doing it to a certain extent right now, but not that badly. But when one of these events happens, we immediately point the finger at the negative media coverage of it as well. We don't do anything to deaden the coverage of it. We amplify the coverage of it, you know, whether it's talking about and, and it's tough because there is a time and place like to use the Uvalde one, there's a time and a place in a forum to talk about tactics and that 
you know, and how law enforcement could have or should have responded to that. However, Johnny six pack CCW is not having that conversation. All he's doing is amplifying coverage of this mass shooting. So there needs to be there. need We need to educate our own side better on the appropriate time and place to have these discussions and the forums that it's safe to have these discussions about tactics, about response to these events versus just talking about them. And I think, you know, an example where it's been handled well has by and large been the Greenwood Mall shooting where the, and and mostly because the kid who did the actual, who actually put the active shooter down has basically been like, I'm not talking to nobody. Like the only statements that have come out have come out through his lawyer and he himself has been like, I don't want to be famous. I don't want to be a part of this and God bless him and more power to him for that. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, it's been, you know, the only people that are now still talking about it are us because we're, you know, we can now kind of get an AAR of the event, uh, from the lawyer, which is who I was going to ping him from. I was going to ping him for tonight, but I thought I'll leave him alone. He's, he's, he's a guy to talk to. Yeah. He's been on, he's been on before. Uh, fun fact, Gunsight graduate. So, okay. you know, if you're going to get a lawyer to defend you after a justified shooting, maybe the guy who went to Gunsight. Good start. That's a good point, Caleb. Uh, Caleb. Matt, you uh, you inadvertently uh, hit two talking points when you uh, when on your last rant there. Uh, so we'll oh, circle that's... back on two talking points from, again, the OSD. Um kind of manifesto here. Uh, yeah. One of our bullet points is coming out of the safe. Um, so as gun owners, uh, a lot of gun owners are like, oh, I don't let anybody know I got guns. You know, nobody at work. I don't, da, 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 da. it's like this, you're kind of in the closet, right? Yeah. Uh, with air quotes. And uh, our position is like, for example, like if I wasn't out of the safe and very open about my competition life, my shooting life, my, instruction, whatever I was doing in, in, uh, at Facebook, we wouldn't have had these, these wins. Um, so it's very tricky and yeah, you got to do it in such a way that evaluate your risk reward trade-offs, but being overly shut in about it, uh, does no one any good. Um, so use your judgment and subtly I, in the discord, we had a discussion about it. There's actually a thread dedicated, um, how to kind of gently come out of the safe without looking, you know, scaring people away, especially because they have these preconceived notions. Um, and that's been very effective was one point you made. The other point you made is, is uh, take a newbie shooting. And uh, this was, John made this comment uh, when we were doing one of the podcasts, like, you know, nobody goes to the anti-gun range, right? It's, it's no fun going to the anti-gun store. Uh, so what we have is great. And I took um, kind of, I've said this a million times and many people know this, but I took over a thousand Facebook employees, Instagram employees to the range. I did that by corporate offsites. So we have a budget, you know, I think it was $200 per head per quarter or half where we could do a team outing. And it was like, Oh, we'll go do drinks or do a build a bear or whatever it is. Somebody came up to me because I knew I was out of the safe and I'm a total gun guy. Like, Hey Chuck, can you take us to the range? Take my team to the range. How many guys you got? I got like 12. I'm like, I don't know any place that can do that. And then like, without thinking, I'm like, I could do it. <laughs> and I did for like five years and oh, literally over 60, 70 groups at a, one, you know, one group at a time, over a thousand people. These are people who had never seen a gun in real life. A lot of tech workers are from overseas, India, China, Eastern Europe, um, all over the country, usually from coastal elite cities, right? Um, in universities. And they were ate this shit up. I think out of the thousand, there were two people who were like, not, this is not for me. I don't want to continue. Everyone else was like, just like, this was really interesting. I'm glad I did it to when can we do this again? Right. Um, so you're all shaking your head. You've all had this experience. Just be good about it. Divorce yourself from the politics. Don't get all worked up about the realities of the bullshit you had to go through to get to this point, to get them a gun in their hand and how even it might not be legal for them to like take this box of ammunition because of the bullshit that's been hoisted upon us. Put that to the side, maybe casually mention it. Oh, by the way, if you put your thumb this way, we'll all go to jail, but uh, we got that covered. So don't worry about it. And like, what? You know, can you tell me more about that? Oh yeah. It's this funny thing where, you know, it's a cosmetic thing. This, this, and this. So um, that 
you do it well, do it safely, you know, have some basic, you know, don't take somebody to the range with 57 guns and like, here's a 500 Magnum. These are really cool. Watch this, you know, take two guns, <laughs> a pistol uh, and a full size pistol, no bullshit freaking compacts or subcompacts, full size pistol, a very kind of, you know, two, two, three or nine millimeter rifle. And just like, let them learn. 22s are great. Just like, let them just repeat. Right. We always want to rush into everything and tell them all these great things and 72 different guns. Do easy stuff, repeat it. You'll have people coming back. Chuck, I think you'll appreciate this. So I used to live in Redmond, Washington, and there's some big tech company headquartered there. That probably, yeah, <laughs> that probably a couple of people have heard of. So uh, the the range that I used to shoot, I would have like a Tuesday night IDPA league. And a couple of the guys that would regularly shoot in the league were members of the unofficial Microsoft gun club. And they had like an internal organization and like an email list and everything of all the people in this club. And you would routinely, they would routinely bring new people to league night, right? Just to be like, Hey, this is what we're all about. Like we like to hang out. It's a good time. We shoot some guns. We all go out to dinner afterwards. And you know, the people that they would bring would always be like these young you know, uh, young guys, disposable income, you know, a lot of times like for minority groups and they all loved it. They're like, this is so much fun. And that's, you know, that, that, that speaks to your point is like, it's, this is fun, right? At the, at the end of the day, this really should be fun guys. And we win at a cultural level when we remind people that do what we do is fun and it's safe and yet we can worry about the deathly serious part and shooting people in the face and all of that later some people here's a here's a thing that we also want to talk about some people will never get there there are plenty of pro gun and again this is the cultural thing right right now part of our cultural zeitgeist is to you know uh be like if you don't acknowledge that the second amendment is for overthrowing tyranny you're not really on our side i'm like hold on there are lots of pro-gun people out there who are never going to take an ECQC. There are lots of pro-gun people out there who are never going to shoot an IDPA match or never going to shoot a USPSA match or do any of these other sort of benchmarks that maybe us at this very narrow end of the funnel have set up, but they're still pro-gun. They still don't want there to be an assault weapons ban. They don't want handguns to get banned. They don't want any of those things to happen. But when we start to gatekeep the levels uh, like when we have to say, oh, you're only pro gun if you're only pro gun if this, right? Well, I support unregulized possession of nuclear weapons. Are you as pro Second Amendment as I am? You know, that kind of stuff, right? So, we, again, and it's easy. I, I will say I fall prey to this and I'm, I'm super guilty of this because I work in the firearms industry, right? <clears throat> It's very easy for me to be siloed off and to look at it from that kind of narrow point of view and forget that like there's 80 million gun owners out there and only 30,000 USPSA members. And so there's, there's a lot of wiggle room in there for Second Amendment support. Yeah. 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 The other thing about that is the funnel, uh, it, it's like a ratcheting strap, right? Like you bring somebody to the, range, to the range and it's like, click, click, click. And then you take them to IDPA and it's like, click, click, click. And you teach them the difference between a rifle and a shotgun and click, click, click. It only goes one way and they don't backslide. It's really, really, really rare in my experience for somebody to learn more about guns and have more exposure to the positive aspects of gun culture and then support more gun control. It almost always goes the other way. And that's a huge, huge advantage in our favor. And it's also why a lot of people um, on the anti-gun side don't want anyone exposed to, you know, what we exactly. do. Exactly. That's why they get so hot with, um, you know, in California, they banned, like, you can't talk to under 18 year olds about guns. What? Really? I, I swear to God. Like, if yeah, no, a, that's a real You're a business, in the like you land right on the now. SIG page. It's like, uh, and they see your IP is from California. It's like, are you over 18? Because it's so broadly and poorly written, it's going to get thrown out in a heartbeat and it's in the process of being thrown out now. But that's the level of like, we got to put up full shields because we, this is the strategy. We were very clearly after being in OSD for so long, the, the very clear strategy, the Bloomberg groups are excellent at playing this long game. The people I met in 2015 are implementing, the stuff they implemented then is coming to fruition now. 
the people they were training then, those lawyers who were their 21, 24 year olds are still there going up and up and up. And their long game is to choke us out. Yeah. So there will be no new generations who have any sort of normalcy around firearms. It's going to be an anomaly. The more they can make it an anomaly, they are driving us to a point, uh, to a tip where the last cold dead hand um, will will be <laughs> literally that, right? Um, so that's, we need to be on the offensive, um, like this J JR 15 fiasco, right? Just a total manufactured crazy thing. I don't know if this is California only, maybe, um, some company makes a JR 15, which is a youth sized AR. I think it's a 22. Yes. Right? Okay. Yeah. And like, that was like, oh my God, this is like, they're selling crack directly to children. Sounds um, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily for us. Um, the, the ray of hope in all of this is when you make something that taboo, then people just get way more interested in it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you can Especially like you go kids. And, right. Yeah. Go ahead and ban everything, you know, everything that you want. But like Pornhub is still the, the biggest website on the entire Internet. Like it, it doesn't work. Right. Uh, is... They banned vaping for kids. Right. Juvenile rates of vaping are higher than they've ever been. Right. Oh, um, okay. You know, shock, right? So right. Uh, speaking on that whole like Californian thing and how you're seeing, you know, uh, AGs from other uh, states are going after gun companies for what's called the Joe, you know, what I'm, what I have referred to as the Joe Camel offense, right? You know, we're marketing to kids and all of that. This is an especially dangerous thing that I'm seeing because it makes companies, even like my company, we are reticent to now get involved with anything youth oriented because we cannot be seen as marketing to children anymore. And that it will, is having a deleterious effect on the youth shooting sports because we're like, ooh, how much do we really want to support this? And it's only when there's a big blanket of support, right? Where we know like NSSF is on board and there's like 56 other companies like you know, I got hit up by a school teacher in Bainbridge to support their kids' field trip to like some history museum, right? I would love to support that. Are you kidding me? Kids getting educated about dinosaurs? First off, fucking love dinosaurs. Secondly, to me, a rational person, that's a PR win. Taurus USA supports eighth, you know, was fourth graders going to dinosaur museum that's a win right that's a, a super duper win because there's nothing political about that because i'm not insane in clown world 2023 that's marketing evil guns to children and trying to i don't i don't know what we're trying to accomplish by paying for a school to take kids to go see dinosaurs so i'm sorry ma'am i would have loved to have supported your class i really would have i know you'll never hear this because you have no idea what the fuck a primary and secondary is but it's stuff like that that to me that's that's the insidious threat that people don't really understand and it's why i'm so big on we as gun owners and shooters as individuals have to take responsibility for teaching the next generation right like you know even if you don't have kids or anything like that if you got a friend who has kids and your friend wants to go shooting make sure that you bring those kids right you as an individual are going to have to do that because until this current legal situation works itself out in court you're going to see a negative downstream effect on youth shooting sports you know unless like wyoming rada whatever state that was unless we get more legislation like that that protects it at the state level which is tough because you have to get that through you know contentious state houses so unless you're in like to get that to happen you have to be one in the reddest of red states and two you have to have a representative who is willing to actually write and put that legislation forward right and that means we as constituents need to actually know our representatives and i'm not talking about like writing them an email about supporting of rights i mean like actually know your representative and like have conversations with them once or twice or three times a year which was a thing i learned from you know sarah and your suppressor thing in minnesota yeah, yeah that works yeah i actually just met with my legislators uh, a couple weeks ago we had a gun owners lobby day um, and it was awesome. Like I had a great meeting with my state senator and 
it's like, hey, so how do you feel about this issue? You know, we're here as volunteers with the Gun Owners Caucus, but um, but we're we're really here to act as a resource for you. Like, do you have questions about gun stuff? Do you need, uh, are, are there areas where you would like uh, expertise? Like you can call anytime you have a question about a bill and I'm happy to walk you through, you know, some of the technical stuff. Um, and he's like, okay, that's great. That's like, he was actually like grateful that we weren't in his face for one <laughs> and that we are uh, come across as reasonable people who you can have a conversation with. Um, and that gives us the opportunity to influence around the edges, right? Because a lot of these folks, you may or may not be able to change their vote. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Um, but the vote is a black, white, yes, no. There's only an on or an off switch. There's no shades of gray in there. Um, but if you look at the entire process, there's a lot more to it than that. So the vote is a yes or no, but what if you could get your legislator to ask a question in committee that could end up tanking that bill, right? So you didn't get their vote. Um, they didn't have to go against their caucus or go against their constituents because that is something they really care about. Um, but maybe they asked one question that derailed the whole thing. Like that kind of stuff happens. Uh, hey, and you here's know, a uh, I, I, do you mind if I interrupt you real quick on this? Oh, sure. Because it's on the committee issue. I mean, I owe you one. <laughs> it, fair. Um, this is a this is something a lot of people don't understand about how the sausage is made. By the time a bill gets to the floor for an actual floor vote, the outcome is by and large predetermined. Exactly. All right. So once a bill has gone through committee and all of the other steps that it needs to take to become a bill, you can go watch School of Rock and learn about all of that. But in all seriousness, once a bill has gone through all of the pre-steps, and there's here's the other thing. There's a lot of stuff that goes into that bill that isn't in like the actual outlined process. Like in between the committee meetings, there's aides talking to each other in hallways about, hey, well, the senator so and so is he down with the thing, you know, because we helped him out at the place with the time with the guys, right? So telling your senators to vote yes or no on a bill or your representatives to vote yes or no on a bill is is good, sure. But if you really want to actually be involved, you need to be involved with these le pieces of legislation when they're at the committee level, before they're at the committee level. Uh, the committee level is probably the most important. I'll say that. That's probably the most important place to be involved. If your representative at the federal level sits on you know, a House committee on crime and there's a gun control bill, they have a powerful voice in that committee because they're sitting on it. Um, so that's an important place to be involved. And the other thing that is important about this is to also understand what bills are never going anywhere, right? So like when Maxine Waters, I don't even know if she's still a senator, but I'm going to write her gun control bill that she writes every legislative session. And it's like ban all the guns and take them back and kick down people's doors and whatever loony nonsense she puts in there. That bill's not going anywhere, and every senator knows it's not going anywhere, and every representative knows it's not going anywhere, but she introduces it so that she can say to her constituents, I did the thing. Writing your pro-gun senator a shrill email about that bill because you got a shrill email from one of the you know gun, right, gun rights groups doesn't move the needle even a little bit. That email gets deleted writing your representative a thoughtful email during the committee phase of a universal background checks bill that is stands a reasonable chance of getting through both houses that can move the needle so it's you it's you have to be you can't just spam don't spam your representatives about every gun issue because not every gun issue is an issue a lot of it is performative and also i'm not saying i, I do also want to say don't don't not write them once it's on the floor, right? Like once it goes to the floor for a vote, don't just stop, okay? Because sometimes people change their votes. That has happened. However, get involved earlier in the process. The earlier you can be involved as a real person, not as just a guy with an email address, the more likely that your representative, your senator, whether it's the state or national level is going to go, oh yeah, 
I have constituents who like feel some kind of way about this. Let me hang on. They, what did they say in that email? Something about how is this going to affect pre-existing guns that I already own? Let me ask that question in the committee. And then that's how this changes. So I, I apologize for interrupting you, but I've really, I cannot foot stomp enough that getting involved early makes way bigger, a way bigger difference than saying, don't vote on bill, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it's really a lack of education on how bills get made into law. This frustrates me so much because the whole, um, let's take, for example, the phrase no compromise. That is a phrase that is 99% of the time uttered by people who have no fucking idea how a law gets made. And so because they have no idea how a law gets made, they think that intervention at any step beyond the vote either doesn't count or that it's compromise. And that's just not the case. And if I could tell people just one thing, you don't even have to get off the computer to do it. You don't have to leave your couch. But if you're going to do one thing to help the cause, learn how a bill gets made. Just do that. <laughs> it's, it's so frustrating to me because the way that we make change uh, especially, so we talked about this earlier in the podcast, we were talking about how, um, how different states are almost like different countries. So in Minnesota, we've got kind of a medium smattering of rights. In California, they've got none, you know, and then you go to somewhere else, uh, like, I don't know, what's a, what's a good example? Uh, maybe like Tennessee. Um, and they've got the- uh, Indiana. Utah. Indiana's yeah. got all the yeah. rights. They've got the whole- Idaho. Idaho's got the whole smorgasbord of everything, right? That means if you live in an area where you don't have majority control, your rights are at risk. So if the Second Amendment is a partisan issue, um, you know, and, and right now it is, it doesn't have to be. Um, but if the Second Amendment is a partisan issue, then you only have rights when you have a majority. And that's a huge problem. Huge problem. So what do you do? You know, if you're in a state where you're in the minority, you can yell all you want about no compromise and you can harass and pester your legislators all you want, uh, like vote no on blah, blah, blah. They're going to vote the way their constituents tell them to vote almost all the time. Right. They're going to vote with their caucus almost all the time. So the way you get changes made is by operating in those margins, like what Caleb talked about. And that's what confuses people because they're like, oh, you compromised. You know, you did, you supported this bill. I'm like, no, we did not support this bill. We turned this bill. Oh, so I'm so sorry, Matt. Plug your ears for a second. Earmuffs, I'm going to say something foul. We turned this bill from a straight up B hole fucking into at least uh, a little bit of lube, right? And if you would rather take the b-hole uh, on the principle of no compromise, then, I mean, that's fine. Um, but if you're going to get it either way, at least take the loop, right? If you don't have a majority, you need to keep your guiding North Star principles in mind. And you always work towards those. And you take whatever you can get until you get there, right? Try having that progress, conversation with somebody about the NFA or G or FOPA, you know, where they're like, well, the gun control act of 68 banned all machine guns. I'm like, yeah, this shit was going to happen no matter what, homie. Uh, then we got FOPA though, which means I can drive from Florida to California with a gun in my trunk and I can fucking arrest it for it. Well, that's the thing is like, you may not have the power to stop it, but you can make it less bad. And if you look at some of these areas of the country where there is no Second Amendment majority, in most cases, the way they ended up losing rights is by chipping them away a little bit at a time, incremental losses. And that's kind of how we think of incrementalism. But the hidden secret here is that incrementalism can work for you. So you can chip your rights back a little bit at a time. We've been doing it in Minnesota. You know, one year we got uh, we got suppressors. We got um, modifications to the capital carry. Fun. This was my favorite one, actually. We got an emergency power 
Powers bill, that meant that the state could not shut down gun shops uh, mm. when, a, when there's a state of declared emergency. We got that in 2015, and that came in handy. Yeah. Right? So incrementalism can work for you, but only if you know how the process works. And only if you if you're guided by your principles, but you use the practical things to your advantage to to make those incremental gains. Right. It's like screaming into the wind doesn't actually give you the ability to fight the power. You know, if you want to fight the power, you actually have to understand how the power works in the first place Mm -hmm. Um, or to crib a line from the OC supertones. If you want to fight the power, you need the power to fight. Uh, Anyone who gets that reference and DMs me about it, I don't know what I'll give you, but you have you you were raised in a similar home to what I was raised in. Um, You'll send him a Paul Harrell sweatshirt. Yeah, that's exactly what I'll do. Um, no, but and and that's the thing that a lot of people don't understand is that one, the incrementalism door swings both ways, and you know this goes back to the drum that we've been beating this whole thing is that no compromise is a it work, looks great on Instagram, right? Right up until somebody wakes up, and you know, right up until you know, no compromise works great on Instagram as a thing to say. Right up until one of these ambulance chasing scumbag lawyers wakes up and goes, "Hey, we're suing these gun companies for marketing to kids, but they don't have any fucking money." You know, it's got a lot of money. Meta, Meta's got a lot of money, so let's sue Meta for allowing this gun content to be on there. Because the second that happens, you know, what Meta does they shut off gun content tomorrow and they write a settlement check, and that settlement check that they write is worth more money than the entire gun industry combined. And to them, it's a line item on a budget somewhere. So you guys like that incrementalism thing swings both ways. And when we're no compromise, it doesn't fucking work in the real world. I would love for it to work in the real world, but it's not, it's not how we win. And we win by chipping them they can be chipping away at gun rights up here and we can be chipping away at gun control down here. And, you know, whoever's got better chisels for it wins. So I got a question for you guys then. No compromise works really well for fundraising and that's it. So if we're chipping away, what about chipping away the opponent? There are a lot of people talking about gun control and aspects of firearms. And clearly they do not know what they talk, they're, what they're talking about. They're talking about new laws. They're talking about new enforcement where we already have it. We need to just enforce what we have. What about chipping away at that and and presenting that? Like shooting gun control people. I'm like, hang on, Matt. Yeah, Yeah, this is what we're going to do. It's got real extreme real quick. Yes. (laughs) Chipping away at their arguments. Because, yeah, please. It's tricky. I mean, um, have a whole podcast about this <laughs> uh, we have an old newsletter about it as well <laughs> it's actually haram for these people to learn about guns right so we actually make the point and in, in one of the, one of our recent newsletter that they are not it, it's actually a benefit that they, they're not interested in learning about guns they want to keep those 30 round clip magazine 20 second you know that's exactly fun. There's yes. no penalty for that. In fact, that's a that that's a that's a that's a selling point. That's a it's a feature, not a bug. Um, so, you know, I don't know if that approach is what we want. I mean, the approach I'm seeing in California. I've been here long enough. I moved to California from New York. My whole life has been in. I've been oppressed my whole life. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when I arrived in California, I was not oppressed. Um, in 1989, I had a wealth of gun rights that just exploded upon me, and then. From 1989 to today, I've lost a lot. And we've worked around almost everything. I will say one thing for California. I have pretty much everything I want outside of suppressors and SBRs because there's always a way, right? And this whack-a-mole is chipping away and just proving how pointless these laws are and how they just cannot stop the signal. They cannot stop the desire to want to do this fun thing, this interesting thing, this fundamental right that is ingrained in my being, right? Uh, If you take the the kind of the natural right approach. Um, So we are, you know, there is that hope of chipping away. And then the courts um, are, have proven to be an excellent chisel. And with the Bruin decision, Heller and everything in between, I mean, the Bruin is huge. I mean, we're expecting, I'm hearing like, and Caleb, you're in Florida right now. I used to be in California. 
No, uh, South Carolina. South Carolina. So um, there is talking in the back, you know, in my back channels, like we're going to, you know, they're going to lose the handgun roster. They're going to lose the assault, quote unquote, assault weapon ban. Um, the carry stuff they're trying to do right now, basically I have better carry rights than probably all of you in California. If I get my permit, which in Orange County is, has been doable for a while, there are no, the, the posted signs have no power. The number of places I can't carry is, is delimit is, is more than it needs to be, but it's well delineated and acceptable enough. Not great. And that's it. Right. I go about my day and I don't have to worry where I'm going or where I'm crossing. Um, a lot of other states, that's not the way. Texas is bullshit. Right. Like fucking Texas. Oh, Texas is a joke for carry. I love to roast Texans. I, I love Texas. They're people. <laughs> but I do love to roast Texans because they're like, we have the best gun laws yeah, in America. Bullshit, I'm like, the oh, fuck you do. Exactly. <laughs> So, yeah, so the, the courts um, are, are that other chisel that I think um, is uh, in our toolbox right now. And uh, God bless Benitez. So I think, you know, to a different sort of chisel, like what Matt's talking about is I don't argue with people about gun rights online. I buy my personal policy. I don't do that. And I don't do that because I don't believe that's a venue where I am going to affect a positive change. I might have a con I might have a very brief reply to someone where I say, Hey man, you know, that opinion that you have isn't based on facts or something like that, or, you know, there's misinformation that's, that's contributed to the opinion that you're holding, but that's it. That's all I'm going to do. And the reason that's all I'm going to do is that's the, anything beyond that turns into trying to win an argument for, even if I'm not trying to win an argument, that other person is probably trying to win an argument. So it's not a fruitful discussion. And I, <clears throat> I quite frankly, don't buy into the idea that I'm arguing to the benefit of the bystanders because the people that are reading this argument have already made up their minds. They're either my supporters or this guy's supporters, and they are not coming to this argument from a place of good faith to learn stuff. The reason why I engage online the way that I do is because I have had people then reach out to me in my DMs and say, hey, you said that there was like misinformation in that guy's post. What were you talking about? That's a private conversation between adults. That's someone approaching me in good faith. That is chipping away at the opponent and chipping away at their arguments. But I genuinely don't believe that having internet shouting matches is chipping away at anything. But it's it's you know what Sarah has talked about where when you engage with people as people, that's when you're chipping away. That's when you're actually making an effect that changes them, not when we're yelling at people online. Um, and although sometimes it is to fun to call people a dummy McDummerton, and Lord knows I have done that many, many, it's, I, I do actually, I do want to say this, there is a time and a place where ridiculing patently ridiculous arguments is the right thing. You know, where somebody says something that's just completely insane, where they're like, oh, you know, if some politician says like 30 bullet assault clip, yes, make fun of them because they're a dummy. That's fine. Um, maybe. But I, I, I don't really see a lot of value in like protracted 400 post Facebook threats, you know? or long Twitter fights or something like that. You know what I mean? This is something as sort of an aside with something we're dealing with uh, right now in my work because there's a very, there's a political situation going on in Brazil that most people in America can't possibly understand because Brazil doesn't have a second amendment. And we get a little, and every now and then I'll get a little bit of blowback on that on my work channels. And I'm just like, Hey, uh, I'm, I have information that you probably don't have access to. So I can tell you that your opinion is not based on a full picture. And then I leave it at that. And if they want to engage with me further, they're free to do so. If they want to continue to have their own opinion, they're free to do that. And if they want to go do more research, they can do that. But what I'm not trying to do in that moment is make an enemy of this person. Yeah, I think there's a time and a place for online arguing. And in order for there to have spectator value, um, you know, like somebody's watching your. There argument. need to be lions. <laughs> In order to have spectator value, you first need to have spectators. Um, you have to have enough spectators who are possible of being convinced to make it worth your time. 
And that's really where the online argument thing falls apart for most people is that it like pound for pound, like minute for minute, is this the most effective use of your advocacy time? Um, I used to do a lot of online arguing. I, I got to be fairly effective at it. Um, however, I don't really do it anymore because now I'm doing other things um, that I feel are a better use of that time. It's not that it didn't work. It's not that it had zero effect. It's just that I can do a lot more with less. It was expensive too. It was expensive yeah. on you. I've done, yeah. you know, I, again, I know oh, definitely. I, it, you can't it, to do it well. It takes effort. And that mm -hmm. effort doesn't come I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's one of those things where if I did nothing else, um, so I used to work in healthcare. Um, I was an x-ray tech. It was a great job for a little while there. And uh and I think when I when I left that job, I made Actually, I don't, I don't even remember the exact amount, but I was making like high $30 per hour, right? It's not, it's not amazing money, but it was very good for me and where I came from. Now, if I had, instead of taking that hour that I was going to spend writing something really, you know, well written and thoughtful and just worked an hour and gave that money to an advocacy group, that's a better outcome. Good, good way to look uh, at it. <laughs> it like, if I spend that hour taking someone to the range, that's a way better out. That's a better return. Um, and if there's just so many other things, um, and that, and not to like toot my own horn, but I'm saying this as a person who was pretty dang good at it. And I think it's so easy to go wrong. And it takes so much social skill and tact to do it in an effective way uh, that it's almost not worth bar bothering. Like you'll, you, I'll, you'll do more harm than good before you even realize it. And I know that cause I've done more harm than good <laughs> in a lot of that. So now that I look back on some of those arguments in hindsight, I'm like, Ooh, that one I didn't do. Ooh, I think I damaged the cause. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but, but yeah, like there's, there's so many other things. Um, one, one thing I do want to touch on, so I can take my $38 and I can give that to an advocacy, advocacy group, um, say I'm going to give it to a state level group. Cause a lot of times those state level groups are the best return on that investment. So they're doing more work with less administrative waste, um, than the average national group. So say I pick a state level group. How do I actually know that I'm getting return on that dollar? Like, how do I know what that group is doing and how do I know if they're an effective group or not? Um, and a good example of that is a lot of states have multiple gun groups. So they'll have, you know, um, <laughs> XYZ, XYZ gun rights, or they'll have the XYZ uh, gun coalition or, you know, whatever the case may be. One of those groups may be good and one may be bad. And how do you tell? Because they look the same. Because if you look at their website, it's all like, yeah, down with gun control. You know, look what we did. Yeah. No compromise. <laughs> and uh, it's very hard to know. Um, I don't think a lot of people are aware of this, but there are gun rights groups out there that take your money and then they filter it through their own, um, their, their own like in-house press services uh, and they filter money back into their own pockets without actually doing anything. And no. that's like, that's one of those things that people don't know about that. And they're like, Oh yeah, I'm helping. I'm helping the cause. I gave money to the group. And it's like, well, did you know that the, the group you gave money to uh, went to the state Capitol and they filmed a fundraising video. And then after they were done filming, they packed up and left before the committee hearing. Because I, I went and bought groceries. It. Yeah, I <laughs> actually you, saw that happen in my state. Did, um, did, did you find that was we, hard like, name? To I mean, find it. I, I know the name. <laughs> yep. Yeah, like, like, come on, name. We we know. You know, there's um, 
there have been first steps made in potential legal action, so I'm not going to name any names and I'm not going to get specific. All right, that's fair. Um, but I will say that not all gun groups are good use of your time and the very con condensed version and how to know that you're not throwing away your money. The only way you can tell the difference is to learn enough about how bills get made yeah. to know how the process works yourself and show up and be there and see who you see. So if I you show it. up for a committee hearing and those people aren't there, uh, if they're not organizing your lobby day for you to go talk to your legislators, um, if they're not, you know, if they're doing anything, if you don't see them anywhere except for in your mailbox, direct mailing you asking for money, yeah. ask them what the heck they're doing. And if they don't have a list of accomplishments to show you, then be very skeptical. Where did my donation go? Where did my donation go is a perfectly good question. Yeah, yeah. And we should like ask that for sure and and expect something more than, well, we did we pressured so and so to do this and that. And like that's almost always bullshit. You know, what about uh, those uh, briefs? I remember always hearing about, yeah, they Caleb, are you okay? Amicus briefs are <laughs> yes. shit. Yes. All right. Look, if well, you... I don't speak about those, I don't know much about that process, but uh, I'm just, just talking like from a straight up like legislative process. Um, if they can't point you to exactly where those dollars are being spent and it doesn't make sense to you as you know how the process works, um, that's a that's a joke group. Like that's well, a waste of money. Something to bear in mind with this specific topic. The group, for the most part, it, this is a small community, and there's a good possibility you're connected. We could play Kevin Bacon and find someone who was present, and we can just we, we can use Facebook. We can reach out and say, "Hey, did you see this organization there?" Because here in their literature, they're saying they won the thing all by themselves. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So let's talk about amicus uh, briefs here for a second, because this is a pet peeve of mine. Um, whenever there's a major case, whether it's at the state level, but usually you see these at Supreme Court level cases where orgs so and so will, you know, say that they filed a brief in support of case X, Y, Z, right? Um, here's how you file an amicus brief. You get a lawyer to write one. I could go get a lawyer tomorrow to file an amicus brief in support of whatever case that I wanted to say that Caleb Giddings Incorporated was in support of. And the amount that I have supported gun rights is whatever I paid my lawyer, which means I didn't support gun rights at all because I just paid my lawyer, right? I supported his fucking boat. So when you look at things like that, it's it's important to be like, okay, what did my money do? And I'm going to, you know, admit like, so I, I will fully admit, like I used to roast GOA about being a do nothing organization all the time, right? GOA did really, really good stuff in Texas. They're, they were boots on like the ground. They were years. in the committee. Yeah, they were in the committee meetings. They were actually working to get expansion to Texas's concealed carry laws. Good for GOA. That is a perfect example where if you are a, Texas, a gun owner in Texas and you donated to Gun Owners of America, you could say, hey, where'd my fucking money go? And they go, oh, here. And they show you that they had a state level lobbyist that they paid a bunch of money to actually be in these fucking meetings. Um, yeah. yeah. So, By the way, she was at every meeting. Not only that, she traveled a circuit around the entire state training people on how to speak at hearings and how to um, – uh, how to lobby their own legislators. Like there was an incredible amount of grassroots work that went into that. So I do want to answer the question from the chat. Yes, there is. There's a, uh, Eric asked if there's a disconnect between state level and federal level lobbying. And the answer is yes. So the NRA used to have, well, the, the NRA is, so if you don't understand how the NRA is organized, largely there's three components of the NRA. There's the NRA, there's operations that manages like membership stuff, puts on NRA annual meetings, uh, your pistol certifications, all of the, the like the actual gun stuff that NRA does is done by ops, right? 
Then there's ILA, the Institute for Legislative Action. That does all of their lobbying and that kind of stuff. And then there's PVF, the Political Victory Fund. Uh, PVF and ILA legally can't be the same organization because you can't have election money going to lob from lobbying firms for reasons, which is fine. Uh, PVF are the people that they send out volu- they send out uh, NRA employee or they did, they don't anymore. They send out NRA employees to states and those guys run phone banks and do door knocks and things like that for pro-gun candidates. So ILA, the Institute for Legislative Action, used to have a state level law, used to have a lobbyist for every state to go to that state's state house and be in the meetings, be in the committees. And you would have representative and you would have lobbyists that maybe had three or four states, you know, that they had to cover, you know, they had these different assigned territories. But there was a major, it cost a lot of money to do that because these dudes were road warriors, right? They were in their states, they were in their buildings, and they were really good at a lot of, a lot of them were really, really good at their jobs. Some of them weren't, but for the most part, these people were good at their jobs and they understood how the sausage got made in Indiana or in Florida or whatever their territory was. And what happened was i will not speak to the uh, cultural issues endemic to nra but for a number of reasons a lot of the funding for those jobs got ramped back it got pulled way way back which meant the road warriors came off the road which meant they then had to do that same lobbying from an office in fairfax virginia instead of doing it from the state house in missouri where the person that was actually passing the bill was located and when you take away that face-to-face touch you start losing more than you start winning it's the here's a fun fact it's the 47 yard line so in football the 47 yard line is where kickers start to miss more than they make on average like statistically speaking and when you take away that face touch from a lobbyist especially at the state level where <clears throat> a lot of these legislators have known each other for a really long time right like this isn't like you know this some of these states have part-time legislatures these guys go they show up they pass their bills and then they go back to running a car dealership and being doctors and shit right and they know the other guys across party lines a lot of the time because they're neighbors so when nra started taking people out of that state level position and their road warriors started going into their states less and less you started to see less effective state level lobbying and that left a hole that hasn't been entirely filled yet if you're in a state that's got a really active organization like the minnesota gun rights association i get it right um no minnesota gun owners caucus minnesota gun owners caucus thank you so i've actually donated to the minnesota gun owners caucus i know because i went to their banquet it was awesome um it is actually a lit uh banquet by the way you guys did a great job but the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus, there you've got an involved state level organization, right? In South Carolina, I have no involved state level organization. In two years, I could probably be the best lobbyist in this state if I really, you know, cared about not having a job anymore. But so yeah, there's a huge disconnect between federal level lobbying and state level lobbying because a lot of people don't understand the guys in your and the guys and gals in your state house 20 30 150 miles away from you can do way more to jack up your gun rights than they, than the federal level ever will and they can do it faster and they can do it without getting on cnn so yes if you have a state level gun rights organization get involved go volunteer be be a, a phone call phone banking works and it's gross how well it works but phone banking works all right because people who still have landlines vote <laughs> that is a scientific fact people who still have landlines also vote so things like this things like that matter but yes to I, that was a long-winded answer but yes there is a disconnect between state level and federal level lobbying I'm sorry, what was that? <laughs> that that was great. And I think one of the cool things about this discussion is it's providing a lot of information that's filling in the blanks that people may not already be familiar with. And hopefully it might provide a little bit of information to motivate people to take some action. 
As I say with every podcast, make sure you support those sources that you have found to be beneficial. If the discussion here is being helpful, make sure you're sharing it. If Caleb just said something that's absolutely awesome and you check his page and you find it's consistent, you know, you probably should be following this guy and sharing this kind of stuff. I don't know about Sarah though. She's, you know, she's okay. A little sketch. Yeah. <laughs> Buy a floodlight. So <laughs> I, I'd, I'd show you I'm it. wearing one actually. And this I, is funny because I, I, I am, uh, I'm obviously female. I am five foot nine and I weigh like 155 pounds and I've been wearing a floodlight too for like the last week and I'm going to wear it for like another week. And it's, comically overly like large <laughs> like i don't, i should never carry full-size guns <laughs> but i'm like eh, i'll just try it and just you know so i know what to say for when our when our customers try it and uh it's actually awesome yeah i have one in my hand right now i'm not going to show it on the video though because that's going to delay the release of the video <laughs> right yeah we, sorry about that that's i have fine. one too and i have a taurus in it because <sighs> <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, been comfortably sitting here all evening with my uh, Enigma and my G19. So oh, that's um, it's very, been very comfortable. Uh, so yeah. let's see here. So we've talked about gun rights through digital means. We've talked about some bias. We've talked about using our connections for good. We also talked about how to navigate some of this stuff and how to figure out which of these organizations are more of a help and how to figure that out. What about those future, future anti-gunners? Actually, oh, my, I... my God, sir. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, can I say one more thing before we move on? Absolutely. Um, if you are not sure how the sausage gets made and you would like to learn. It's um, a lot of sausage. There's a lot of it. Yeah. You can just start showing up for stuff. Uh, because everything is everything that we're talking about is all like this is all public record. You can just start showing up at your state capitol. Um, you can just start volunteering with some of these groups. And the best way to learn is to just be there. Um, you know, every everybody has jobs and families, and that's hard to do. Um, but even just you know twice a year, if you can just go volunteer and do something, that's the best way. Um, you really, you get to know people and you form a social group and it, it's really fun. You get to hang out with your friends at the Capitol and then, you know, go get burgers after. Um, it's accessible is the point of that. Uh, Matt, on that topic you brought up, I just want to clarify when I, I actually suggested it. I, my suggestion was um, what does the um, next generation of 2A advocates look like? Um, so which is probably maybe a more interesting conversation. <laughs> oh, I would love um, to map out and figure out, okay, they're going to do this. They're going right, to come off could, over that ridge. Both sides would be interesting, but, um, you know, we gotta, if we talk on the offensive, um, what are the next generation of two advocates going to be? Um, the, you know, the floods are dying out. The, the NRA old guard is, is dying out. Um, and this is gets to something actually Caleb talked about and was talked about in the channel like we do have cultural things that are forming the next generations. And the obvious thing was like, okay, video games, like the pervasiveness in cool guns in media, in movies, and as much as we complain about Hollywood um, and, you know, John Wick style stuff and all the first person shooters and the detail that they go in. In fact, in fact, licensing HK and SIG and, and Glock and proper things. Um, we need to help that go forward, obviously, because you can talk to, uh, and then you have the, you know, the, the popularity of, of Mike, uh, you know, Grand Thumb and, uh, Lucas and T-Rex and, uh, for the more artistic kids, the, uh, you know, forgotten weapons. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's a little bit of slice for everybody to go say like, oh, this is accessible and interesting because they are on the platforms. They're on Instagram, they're on YouTube. They will not be on TikTok because of the terms of service on TikTok, which I went over in my talk at the uh, shot are just horrendous. Um, but our main monopoly platforms of um, YouTube for video, Instagram for kind of quick, uh, quick, quick content. Uh, and Twitter might be another fertile ground now in the age of Elon 
that we have a beachhead that can be established there because he is one not to buy into the, the media narrative. He's very clearly given indication that he is not just going to go with what he's, you know, kind of read on the internet uh, or what's been fed to him. Um, so those things are going to be important. Um, and those kids are going to, you know, Caleb talked about like, Oh, it'd be great to get something to school for, you know, I'm picturing like a, you know, chipmunk 22s at 20 yards, you know, shooting NRA, you know, B19s, whatever the, the, targets are um no it's gonna be like i want to run a scar on steel like from a VTech, you know wall kind of stuff right uh, i don't know how to do that and i know but i know i want to right so i think the whole paradigm of like what we what people expect when they go to the range especially younger people is not going to be bench shooting at paper at 100 yards or 25 yards single-handed bullseye it's going to be like how can i do stuff like a thumb how can i do stuff like my cod or, or the derivatives um you know how do i make it like that generation's idea fun right you know on the the tiktok thing for just briefly like tiktok is tough right you know it's terms of service and all of that stuff is very tight and they they delete content unilaterally uh, without uh, with very little review and all of that. Uh, but where there's a to your point earlier, where there's a will, there's a way because there is I I'm, I have I have a TikTok. Uh, I got it initially for professional reasons, and now I get it because I I now I I, I doom scroll it sometimes. But there are creators talking about guns on tiktok there is firearms related content on there right now and the downside to that is a lot of it is really bad yeah <laughs> agreed. they've basically squelched it or neutered it in such a way that kind of the shit gets through yeah well yeah, and a lot of people the, are not bothering yeah it's it but that's what it is is the serious people are not bothering chuck haggard is not on tiktok right <laughs> You know, well, they so, tried. Believe me, I've had the conversations with them yeah. um, across the board, and I tell them like we look at the terms of service and what the action has been, and and even in direct contact with them, they're not interested. Well, you know, Doc's not interested. It's it's and it, it's diff. It is so difficult. But I will say this: if you're smart, you can figure out the algorithm. Uh, you still won't win. But <laughs> you can. There, there are people out there who are having those conversations. You have to be very careful on TikTok with like what you show, right? And See, even yeah. the the words that you choose, you can't say kill people on exactly. TikTok. Yeah, I mean the the that's certainly a battlefront. We should continue to chip away at that. But like the main YouTube, Instagram, Twitter are the ones that we should be putting our effort, and we should not back off those platforms. I go bananas. Like I'm going to pull a cal uh, a cal up here and say like stuff that drives me nuts. When the 2A, you know, people are like, oh, we'll go to Rumble or go to this or go to that. It's like, that is a losing strategy. Yeah. Okay. I think you should do that in addition, if you want to have backups or have an archive of what your actual content was, in case you lose it, always put it there in parallel, but we need to stay in the public square. Yes. Yes. Right. 100%. We cannot back off, just be a constant pain in the ass. Like that suppressor thing with YouTube, right? Like we all, I don't know if people are aware, but there was a little, there was a panic. I got all sorts of calls and like, you know, anyone on YouTube, like, they YouTube got crazy about putting suppressors on firearms or using suppressors in videos for like a week. And they took down suppressor companies. They took down suppressor content. I think it might've been related to that Mac 10 in that California shooting that had a faux or possibly homemade suppressor on it. Believe me, I've been on the inside. When, when a shooting happens, there is a team of hand ringers internally that respond to every, there's a crisis team that stands up because unfortunately, you know, to give a little bit of um, consideration to the social companies, they do have to deal with complete assholes who will exploit that and like praise the shooter, do all sorts of copycat kind of stuff, just just really dumb things that they need to make sure it doesn't show up on the platform because they don't want their asses hauled in front of Congress yet again. It's yep. a huge cover your ass thing. They overreact because they need to just cover their ass and it's not worth being nuanced and make sure we don't trample anyone's rights when we take down this content. Screw it. Just fucking nuke it, right? Suppressors nuked, right? And at some point they can back that off and they did, right? But it took us there screaming about it, tagging YouTube and all the posts, getting all sorts of back channels, working with any employee that you know, go to LinkedIn, find your first, second or third order 
you know, relationships with anyone at, at Alphabet or Meta or what have you and say, like, if you know they're sympathetic, like, hey, can you do anything about this? Right. Um, so let's keep on those platforms. Let's just keep being a thorn in the side. Do not lose our ability to be on these things. I think this is in service of the question. Like this is where our second next generation of second amendment advocates are, are coming from. Yeah. Well, and I do think that you, I, I absolutely agree. You can't see the common ground. You cannot see Twitter or YouTube or any of those things. And I also think that's also where, and that's because that's where the education is happening. Right. So if there is one thing that NRA has been correct in predicting, it has been the demise of the traditional gun education model where like my dad gave me my first gun and taught me how to shoot, right? That is becoming less and less common. I need to put a big asterisk on that statement. It's still pretty fucking common. That is still the primary vector that most people learn about guns is through an immediate or maybe one generationally removed family member or close familial acquaintance. However, the you know the percentages have changed, right? It used to be like 80 80 percent of that was your vector for gun ownership. It's down to like 60 now. That means 40% of new gun owners are coming into vectors that we may not be familiar with. It may be through video games. It may be through television. It may be through a friend in the Microsoft gun club or something like that, right? So if we are, if we know that our traditional vectors are dwindling in adding new activists to the stream, then we need to be proactively in the spaces that are adding these people to the stream, right? We need to, you know, and I'm not saying that this is for everybody, but we need to have gun owners who are USPSA shooters and also play Battlefield. You know, they need to be conversant in that space so that when someone says, oh, you got the new Battlefield game, I love what the fucking Tacta Blaster 9000 does in that game and you're like it is pretty cool but it's you know it's even cooler doing that with a suppressed mp5 and you have right. a suppressed mp5 because you're a baller or whatever but being able to translate that from <clears throat> from their vector of entry into the real world is hugely important and I also think these and these are all opinions by the way and if you, people feel free to tell me that I'm wrong whether it's in the comments or whatever I also think that it's bad for us to assume that the entry vector that added 8 million gun owners during the COVID-19 pandemic is going to be a consistent entry vector. Hmm. Uh, I don't, because I don't think that's true. I, I, I don't feel that the unique combination of political, socioeconomic, and legal like crime uncertainty is a reliable vector for adding high numbers of gun I'm owners to the I'm not sure community. about that. I think anything that that whole episode, I think, put people off axis enough that they're going to be even more sensitive to the next kind of disruption, like these balloons coming over the, over the border, right. Or these objects, uh, the, 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 in, 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 you know, the incoming alien invasion. I think that's still like that human drive for like self-preservation. I need to take action. I think is still going to be pretty strong. Now your, your point is that why are we going to have things as dramatic as a back-to-back -back COVID slash, right. You know, global pandemic slash global uh, civic unrest together. Um, I would say yes. Another, again, another uh, great article uh, from our archives uh, is the surprisingly mathematical case for the tinfoil hat prepper. Uh, one of our writers is a civil engineer and uh, BJ Campbell. And one of his uh, newsletters is basically breaking down the mathematic probability of a kind of a, a global event, a, a apocalyptic style event in X number of years for X number of human lifetimes. And that number is surprisingly low um, on the order of like 80 to 100 years kind of thing, right? You can have these, these things affect you. So I don't know, uh, Caleb, if you're saying like you don't expect more events like this or you don't, you think people will get numb to it. Nothing really, really bad happened. They didn't need that gun. So they'll kind of be like, ah, eh, I'm still good. The latter, not the former. I think that we culturally grow more immune to these things mm -hmm. as they happen. 
Um, the well, there's toilet paper on the shelves. That well, yeah, just, toilet, you, you know, know to go back know, to that... school, you know, to go back to school shootings as an example. I was in high school during Columbine, so I remember it as a very significant cultural touchstone, right? And then really the next one that was really at that had the next one that had that sort of same level of effect was uh sandy hook there were ones in between columbine and sandy hook then but sandy hook was really bad because it was like little kids and that really got everybody's attention um and then there were ones in between sandy hook and parkland but parkland was really bad it got a lot of people's attention so i think that there is an ebb and flow of awareness and numbness to a lot of this stuff so I'm not saying that there won't be another global pandemic or another global event that makes people concerned for their safety. What I'm saying is we cannot rely on those to drive people to be actual activists and participants in this, right? If I bought a 12 gauge shotgun because I was worried about rioters burning my neighborhood down and I stuffed it in my closet, I haven't become an activist. I've become a gun owner. So I can't necessarily rely on that to turn those people into allies. I can rely on it to help fund the industry, which is nice, but that doesn't necessarily turn that person into an ally and an advocate. Good point. And Just that like what was Sarah a, said with clicks. Yeah, that was a point of OSD was to reach out to those people. We did Zoom office hours um, for during the pandemic for anybody who showed up. We did dozens and dozens of first-time gun owners like, either what do I do to buy this or now that I bought it, what do I do? Um, so that's a, that's a good point. That was such a great program. And I referred people to you and you guys are awesome. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. Um, yeah. So one thing I, that we do, um, and again, I'm, this is my opinion, not the opinion of my business, separate things. Um, but for me personally, what I see is that people who are making the step not just to buy a gun and stuff it in a drawer and never look at it again, but people who are serious enough about this to make the step that they are going to concealed carry on their person. Those people have a much higher than average um, give a damn. Yeah. Um, and I think that those people are, are really ideally um, kind of positioned to become lifetime community members and, and long-term uh, long-term people. So it's not political advo uh, advocacy. However, part of the reason that um, I have worked so hard to put out so much educational material is because I feel that breaking down the barriers for people to successfully carry and to, to make it a part of their life, a seamless part of their life, I feel like that is really important to retaining people in this community long-term um, and and they're really invested and they have a stake and they have something to lose. And those are our best pool of future advocates. Yeah. Agreed. I think we covered a lot of really good stuff. And to be honest, if you guys want to do another, we could do this every couple months. We could do this every week. Okay. Maybe not every week. Calm down with the every week <clears throat> thing. No, I think it's okay, good every to day. revisit it. Yeah, to yeah. revisit every now and then because the landscape changes, events change. Um, we'll yeah. see. I think uh, certainly the three of us are pretty plugged into what's going on um, to update. Like, yeah, what we kind of saw was getting better, or this is kind of going worse, or this was not predicted, and and this is a new kind of front. Um, I think this would be a great idea. Also, yep. with a little yep. bit more uh, heads up, we can get some additional people to join and attack different angles. Um, there is one topic that we haven't really talked about. I thought it wouldn't be a bad idea to bring up just as a tail end conversation. Um, infighting among the community right now, <clears throat> there's a, 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 a popular social media entity that's catching a lot of heat, eh, very pro gun, but it's just kind of sad to see. And, and it's, and, and people just want to jump on it and throw gas on the fire and it, in my opinion, knowing parties involved, I'm not seeing this. Be, I'm not seeing this to be a positive thing for gun rights. I, I'm completely out of the loop. I don't know who's there's with nothing who. wrong with that at all. I, think, I thought we were just talking about the people who hate Cali, uh, Caleb. Yes, <laughs> we, are. we are. We are. Yeah, I mean, we're yeah. talking about Caleb. Okay, I kind of I know what you're talking about a little bit, um, yeah. and I've 
so I've been immersed in social media for since 2007 because it's been my job in one way or another. Um, I'm not probably a normal person, or you, no one should em- emulate the you know my ingestion of this stuff. I think I've been able to do it clinically. It's a not affect my personal health and mental health and well being. Um, so, but I do like just ingest this stuff on a regular basis. Um, I know what you're talking about. I've seen a million of these as, over the years as well. The good news for all this, uh, Matt, is it's completely internal. Yeah. It's, it doesn't really bleed. The other, like the normies don't really get what the hell the beef is. And, and even if they did, it's like, why, what, you know? So this is all just really, again, on the edges of the bell curve, the people who are kind of driving this stuff and they are more unhealthily consuming that social media. Um, and that is more central to their lives and their business. Um, so that kind of stuff is, is, I don't think it's really matters too much in the grand scheme of things. It is disappointing. I don't want to see, you know, I want to be everyone on the same team, but it's never going to happen. Um, and there are, you know, serious dysfunctions going on. We should, should weed out the people, you know, why should I say it? We do want to be aware of, of things that are truly a problem. Yeah. Um, well, uh, one of the things we've discussed in the past many times, I've written about it and talked about it. And it's seeking out that uh, outrage. And yeah, just want to get that outrage. How how does that affect? How does that positively affect anything? Yeah. Remove it from your life. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, uh, that's kind of what I was thinking too. Like when you were making your point, Chuck, is like this stuff, a lot of this like infighting, um, really just like the less attention I pay to it, I feel like the better because there's always going to be a group with this opinion and a group with this opinion. And then there's going to be people in the middle that are really mad that you're not just getting along. <laughs> it's like all of those people kind of feed off of each other. And it's like, it's just not important. And yeah. on the, the um, political side, it's the same thing, you know, like there's um, two gun groups in Minnesota. Uh, one is, is actively libeling and slandering the other. Uh, and, and there's, it's to the point where people are like, well, why can't you just get along? Well, because libel and slander affects our ability to advocate. And, you know, like those things matter. And it's not that, you know, like our community needs sometimes our own internal kind of policing. Like we have to police ourselves. Um, and it's sometimes really hard to sort that out from the people that just like fighting for the sake of fighting. Like there's sometimes you need to just assert your boundaries and be done. Um, And people will see any conflict between parties as like, Oh, you know, it's the end of the world. They're fighting. They should just get along. And you shouldn't always just get along. (laughs) Um, But also like, you know, it is very possible to read about the beef and just Go on about your day. Yes. Yes. It's also possible, which I feel weird that I'm the guy saying this, to be completely unaware of the beef and (laughs) not have a dog fight whatsoever. I think I know Um, maybe like 5% of it. So I don't even like, I don't even care enough to. The good news is it's actually hard to unravel because it's so, it's like across different Instagram stories and posts that have been taken down or this is up. It's like, you can't actually unravel it. It's just, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. So the moral of the story here is internet beef is silly. Like, and I say this as someone (laughs) who has, you have no experience with it. it. (laughs) You guys can say that being a dad has changed me and maybe it has, but also I'm just older and I'm really tired a lot of the time guys. So I just don't have the, I have a full-time job. I have a part-time job working for the government, which is like half a full-time job. And I have a child and a wife. I don't have time to keep up with who's betraying gun rights anymore. So like, you just be cool to each other. Okay. Can we try that for like a thing? You're going to start a band called Wild Stallions, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> well, excellent discussion. As I said before, I, I think we could very easily have a sequel to this and continue on, kind of do a sit rep of what has occurred in the, uh, since. 
But before we end this, let's get some final thoughts and some final plugs from everyone before I hand the mic over to people. Pay attention to who they represent. Pay attention to the companies that they mention. If you like what these guys had to say, make sure you follow them. If they're producing content that helps you, you should share it. And again, you've had plenty of time. If you're watching this on YouTube, if you're listening to it on an audio podcast, hit that like button. Feedback's also kind of nice too. Sarah, what do you have for us? Um, I would like to, again, since my company uh does not represent my political opinion in the slightest. What I would like to do is plug other people that I think are doing a really good job. So obviously open source defense, follow them, share them, give them money. They're doing really, really good work. And I know for me, it's, it's so incredibly refreshing to see a group who is able to kind of transcend the whole outrage porn paradigm and still be successful. I think that's awesome. So I, I would love to see these guys everywhere. I would love an open source defense lobbyist in every state. That would be amazing. Maybe someday. Um, but they're doing awesome. Um, also, FPC, which I think, again, um, they're not perfect, but they are, in my opinion, one of the best returns for your dollar that you can get right now. Um, Second Amendment Foundation, also doing great work. Um, and then the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. Um, now, any any quality, non-scam, state-level gun rights group is going to probably be a pretty good investment for you. Um, but even if you don't live in Minnesota and you got a couple extra dollars this month that you want to kick over the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus, we could really use it. We are getting hammered. Um, and yeah, it stinks. But I know in past years, I've donated to... Um, California, I've donated to Virginia, just seeing like, okay, Minnesota's doing pretty good this year. Where can I put my dollars? And if you're in a state that's doing pretty good this year, put your dollars in a state that's not. So uh, yeah, there's Minnesota, there's, um, I think Oregon and Washington are kind of getting slammed. Um, there's, there's a lot of states that are really in trouble. And if we can kind of focus our resources where they're most needed, it helps all of us across the country. So it's like, a lot of this nasty gun stuff starts in the states that are weakest, but it spreads. So if we can stop it there, that's even better. It spreads just like California residents, Chuck. <laughs> I am actively looking for property in Texas and Florida, so I'm sorry. Wait, so you're part of the problem. Minnesota's awesome. And I, I'm partially I, I appreciate your opinion, but <laughs> we'll leave it at that. It is cold. <laughs> Yeah. We do have a saying that the cold keeps the Californians out. Sorry, Chuck, yeah, but <laughs> you should be thankful for that. They're really horrible. I mean, it's no, I'm not, I'm a New Yorker true and true, but they're obnoxious too. So I have no, I have no home. I should just give up. <laughs> Caleb. Fun fact. I'm actually from California. Just a million I was born years there. ago. Yeah. I, I grew that. up, yeah. I grew up in LA. Um, so two things. I just donated a hundred bucks to the Minnesota, uh, gun owners caucus because, real recognizes real and you guys are the homies um but uh as far as like you know again so i, I have my professional affiliations you guys can follow taurus usa on instagram facebook all of that stuff uh but if you want to follow me personally uh my facebook uh public facing page is facebook.com slash caleb shooting um and then on instagram you have to actually i'm low key shadow band you actually have to type in my full instagram username which is radicaleb r a d i c a l e b it's a portmanteau that's your dictionary word it's when you take two words and mash them together but go follow me on instagram uh or facebook i post a lot of my content there um and a lot of it's really lighthearted. I'm trying to have fun these days. Uh, I'm not trying to be mean to people as much as I used to be. Every now and then I get a, I get a wild hair up my ass. Um, and you can follow me on YouTube as well. Uh, Mr. Revolver is my YouTube handle. I don't really update as much as I used to because as I earlier mentioned, I have a job and a kid and another job. And like, I like to sleep occasionally. But um to what Sarah said, I strongly encourage you guys to go out there and support groups that are doing the Lord's work, right? Like if you are 
as a former Minnesotan and someone who still has like a lot of really close friends there, if you are in the state of Minnesota and you're not supporting the caucus, do so, please. You know, they they can use your help and they have literally moved the needle on gun rights in Minnesota. Um, yeah. So really just whatever state you're in, unless you're in like a super, you know, even if you're in a red state that's super safe and you think it's super safe, it may not be super safe forever. So now again, now's the time to get involved. So here's what I will say. If you're like an IDPA guy or a USPSA guy and you shoot at a club regularly and you are not a member of that club, like, and I mean, like, I don't mean your IDPA club, but I mean, the range club that hosts those events right like there i shoot matches idpa matches at a club called the belton gun club i made sure to become a member of that club because you know who does vote people who are members of gun clubs you know where you can move the needle go to your gun club's monthly meeting and say hey guys i don't know if you were aware of this but there's a bill in committee and we should all like you know make an effort to call our legislature so for me as a shooting sports guy that's where you can make an impact if you're in the shooting sports get involved in that club that you shoot your uspsa idpa steel challenge matches at because those guys there's an opportunity there to move the needle and also you can help act to preserve the shooting sports because not all clubs are friendly to that which i know may be shocking to you but sometimes these idpa or uspsa clubs are fighting for their lives because you know, the bench rest guys don't understand all that running and shooting. Charles Q. Rossi Esquire. Charles V. Rossi. It will, oh, v. Uh, v is in Vincent. Yeah, well, oh, okay. happily, uh, uh, Caleb or anyone else, if, uh, if you had gone to my talk at shot this year, or you could have learned about that shadow ban and how it works and how to check for it. Um, I was literally chained to my booth. Like. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, yes, I can. Um, if anyone has questions about their socials, um, it's harder for individuals, but if you're an organization, a business, um, or a, a content creator slash influencer, um, I can still try to help, uh, on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, you can message me on those platforms at open SRC defense is our Instagram and our Twitter. You can use those to contact, or you can email me at Chuck at open source defense.org. Um, no guarantees, but I've had good success to this day of getting stuff escalated. I got something back today that took literally it's been down for six months, took me four weeks of nagging. Um, and this guy just made grips like skateboard style grips for guns. I had a hundred thousand followers built his life on this thing since he was a kid, um, had 121,000 Instagram, took it down. No reason why it was not actually because of guns, uh, which are the easy ones to get back, believe it or not. It was some other random Instagram bullshit thing that they wouldn't, they don't tell even in the, as an employee, they won't tell you what happened. They'll just say it went against this policy of authenticity or something. Um, but we got it back today. Um, so there's always hope it doesn't always work, but, but just contact me and I'll, I'll do my best. Please support open source defense. Uh, as Sarah was very kind and, and kind of, uh, giving, uh, the reasons that, uh, that she finds us useful. I hope you will too, but you're not going to, unless you find it. So our Twitter open SRC defense, our Substack newsletter, our website, open source defense.org, our discord open source defense. Um, all avenues you can get a hold of us. You can support us. Um, we haven't, this is the first thing we're doing ever to do any sort of fundraising because people would come to us constantly. Like, how can I give you money? How can I support? We had buy a coffee. People have been very generous with that. We now have levels through the Substack. If you want to support us, we'll just give you more kind of bonus stuff in the discord. Um, if you want to do a small monthly thing, uh, we'd appreciate it. We have range days. OSD range days have been a big success where I basically continue that outreach to non-traditional people who are interested in guns. We've had one uh, with all women. We've had one um, with more tech people. We've had one OSD's Rolodex of who follows us. We don't have a lot, but the people we have are really high quality. Um, it is not a trivial mailing list. It is, you know, we see obviously who subs subscribes and there's venture, ca venture capitalists. There's C-suite executives. There are quote unquote, you know, important people. And I cannot express to you enough how the other team has a lot of quote unquote important people, you know, shilling their stuff. We have no one of any quote unquote importance 
that is willing to stand up and say, I'm a gun owner, yet alone, I think there should be more gun rights. This in the public perception is a big, big hole, right? No CEOs, no major corporations, no ad agencies, no coastal elites in New York City and Los Angeles and San Francisco um, are willing to do this. Um, OSD is a gateway drug for them to come through. And we have those people on our list. We've taken them shooting privately um, and we'll continue to do that. Um, and so finally, just to outdo Caleb, because because um, OSD will happily donate $5,000 to uh, the caucus in Minnesota. And I will sync with Sarah on how to get that done. So, I am totally happy to be outdone if that's like <laughs> the bar. Like if I'm like, here's a hundred bucks, you're like, here's five G's, like make it fucking rain. I'm in Make it that. rain. So we appreciate Sarah. Um, I will plug, <laughs> I know she's not associating this with Philster or the Enigma, but I cannot express how I think the Enigma is the only solution for concealed carry. Um, and that's what I advocate for new concealed carry users uh, when we take people who are going down that route. Uh, it's good stuff. So happy to do that. Sarah, thank you and John uh, for all you do. Um, and thank you, Matt, for doing this. Uh, you have a long running thing here. We first talked, I think in 2016, like you said, and it's still going strong and you have a good group of people. Um, and uh, thanks for keeping it going. It's a lot of work. Thank you. And thank you to the panelists. Again, outstanding discussion. And this kind of discussion this is the kind of thing you can have with coworkers. You can have it with family members, with neighbors. It's just a matter of knowing what the facts are. And then you can share some information. You can share your feelings about rights. Nothing wrong with that. Unless it's against company policy, then there's a problem. <laughs> um, big thanks to the sponsors. Big thanks to Big Tech's Ordinance. Overwatch Precision. Gilster. Primary Arms. Walther. Also, big thank you to the Patreon subscribers. Um, as I said before, make sure you're supporting those sources that you have found to be beneficial. If this episode was was helpful to you, uh, make sure you share it. Personally, for me, I, I uh, there were so many good points, um, and, and I'm happy to also share it with coworkers. Uh, it's it's cool to get cops in on these kinds of discussions to hear this, um, because then this opens up their minds to these concepts and they can pass it on. Um, let's see here. I think we might have an episode going tomorrow. We'll, we'll see. Um, if you happen to be in the market for a pocket knife, Scallywag Tactical gave me a code. The code is all caps PNS10. And it gets you 10% off. As a matter of fact, I'll get mine out of the pocket right now. I got, it's a, you know, it's a nice solid pocket knife. I like it. Um, we are on Facebook. We have 736 different groups. Uh, we have a page. We have a forum at primaryandsecondary.com slash forum. We don't really have 736 groups, by the way. It's close. Um, we have a website. A new article just came up. Um, Brandon just posted something about uh, the Dark Star Gear Apollo. Um, let's see here. What else? Yeah. All, the, all these resources that we have on primary and secondary are for free. They're for your use. Uh, if there's anything of anything that can help you, use it, share it. If there's anything that you need, don't hesitate to reach out to me, Matt at primaryandsecondary.com. We can put together specific podcasts. We can put together articles, we can do videos. It's typically when someone has something that they need help with, there are others that are going to benefit as, benefit from it as well. So always happy to help out. I think that's pretty much everything. I think my voice is about to just, just die. It's kind of awesome. Mm -hmm. Is it bad that I'm tasting blood? Is this? No. Um, <laughs> fine. You're good. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. Again, thanks for listening. Uh, hopefully, hopefully you pick something up. I know I did. And this is another one of those episodes that it's nice to listen to these perspectives because I can use this in my work and dealing with people and talking to people about rights. It's amazing how that kind of a topic will come up on a traffic stop. Pull someone over. They have a firearm. Sweet. I'm glad you're carrying. What are you carrying? Cool. This is what I'm carrying. And a, a good conversation comes, comes up and I, I meet so many good responsible gun owners. So that's all. I guess I will talk to you later. <laughs>